I'm a big believer that regression of the mean is a force of nature. I got an argument with some say, oh, the markets can just keep going up. I said, no, they can't. 20% of the S&P can't pay their interest payments with their cash flow. These are the 500 biggest companies in the United States. The overarching theory that covers all these concerns of ours is that someone's trying to destroy us. Do you believe that? Well, let me ask you this. Are we trying to destroy Putin? I think the S&P is going to unwind sub 2000. There's people but, right now who are going to hear you say that and they're going to go shut their computer and walk, go for a walk outside. Well, what do you disagree with? All right, guys, I have Dave here. I, th I don't know. We've recorded two or three times. This one's going to be the best one because we live in the most chaotic <laughs> times. Uh, let's maybe start with the easy stuff. Uh, the Federal Reserve, okay. they for, I don't know, months told us inflation is transitory. Newsflash doesn't seem so transitory. They now are saying that they're going to create tighter financial conditions and that will bring down inflation. Doesn't seem to necessarily be working. What's your general read on uh, the Federal Reserve as uh, the market maker and uh, ultimately the judge, the jury, and the executioner of, uh, of financial assets right now? Um, I don't think they have control of, of the inflation at all. You know, um, Roach warned about it in an article about two years ago that they were making the same mistake as Arthur Burns um, uh, smart guys I know, like Einhorn and stuff, all say it's gotten into the DNA. Uh, the question I like to ask rhetorically is if you're a contractor and you were going to build a house two years from now, what, what sort of, uh, uh, markup would you put on, on materials and labor to, to bid that house? And, and the number would not be 3%. So that, that's the inflation expectation problem. And I think, I think it's, I think it's profound. Um, the idiots who say because inflation held firm at eight and a half percent, which we can ignore the, you know, it's not eight and a half percent story. Um, it's much higher. But um, uh, Jimmy Iorio yesterday said his restaurant's doing 23, 24 um, percent. In any event, um, um, the, the headline was that it, it didn't go up anymore. And, and then Kamala, uh, the rocket surgeon, said, therefore, there was no inflation. So it's sitting at eight and a half percent by official number. She said, therefore, there's no inflation. I go, uh, Kamala, you should have taken calculus. That's a second derivative thing you're talking about there. So when, when you see this, so uh, I think using the construction example is a perfect way to look at uh, markets, to look at uh, how the real economy works. And uh, I don't know what the answer is in terms of a, con a contractor that is looking to bid a house that'll be built, you know, forget two years, just one year from now. Right. Uh, and, and I agree it's not 3%. Uh, and I actually think they don't know. And so some of that is just them causing slowdowns, them trying to wait. Uh, when we saw the explosion in lumber prices, there was a ton of people saying like, we have no clue where this price will be 30 days from now, let alone, you know, six months or, right. or 12 months from now. And so I guess less about the specifics of the numbers, but just when you have so much volatility in various parts of the economy and so much uncertainty, what are the second and third order effects of that? Should we expect there to be breaking of additional things across the economy just because people are scared or people are uncertain of the future? Or has markets always operated this way and maybe it's just being magnified because we're seeing big inflation numbers? Well, to the extent that you, we've all seen over and over and over numbers quoted saying that the average person doesn't have $400 to, to, to you know, replace a microwave if, uh, if it breaks. And now the cheap ones cost 400 so that's a good number. Um, to the extent that they say that it, the median family doesn't have that, then if all of a sudden you tack on, let's say conservatively, eight and a half, nine, ten percent increase costs annualized, uh, where is that money going to come from? And and so I think you can hear, you know, uh, glass shattering, you know, teeth flying around the room now because I think the average family can't pay the bills. Yeah. And, and as we see this, obviously, uh, core inflation tends to be a metric that uh, uh, economists and politicians love to point to. I see you shaking your head. Uh, core inflation having uh, all the things that you actually consume not included, uh, which is, you know, some big brain uh, mathematical uh, analysis. What what should we actually be paying attention to? Is the CPI number the thing to watch? Is it uh, something like real wage growth? Like, how do you actually analyze uh, via the data that we are provided what's going on? Well, ironically, um, I mean, 
Remember when inflation was low and everyone was ranting about how it would be great if they had inflation? I thought it would somehow deal with their their mortgages and stuff. And I'm going, you guys have no understanding of inflation. No one who's lived through a serious inflation, which I'm old enough to remember in high school uh, and in college, no no one who's lived through it knows that it's good news. Uh, Anyone who's lived through it knows it's it's bad news. Um, these guys who say somehow's going to erode their debt or something are dreaming because their 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 wages are not going to keep up, and when the wages catch up, then you have all these secondary effects like uh, well, first and foremost, the markets are going to cut their profit margins in half easily because of the labor costs, and uh, and and so they're going to have to either jack up prices, which is going to make it even worse, or they're not going to be able to jack up prices, which means that the market's just doubled valuation. So there, there's things like that. Um, there's just so many. What do, you, what do you do if you've signed a contract for five years? For uh, I have a dog in my lap, so it's going to be a little jiggly here. Uh, what do you do if you've signed a contract for five years? And all of a sudden, your cost of goods and services or the projections are just way the hell wrong. This gets back to the house, but, but there are long-term contracts. You know, there's people who have, you know, five-year wage contracts because they signed them. Uh, their union rep signed them back in 2019. I don't know. It's just, it's just nothing good comes of inflation. Yeah. And the people who think it does are just, have just not seen inflation before. And when we look at something like the labor market, uh, obviously the Federal Reserve and many other organizations continue to point to a strong labor market. And they're specifically looking at the unemployment rate sitting, you know, 3.5, 3.6%, uh, open roles in America, 10, 11 million, depending on the week. Uh, is it something where the labor market will be a lagging indicator of a recession or trouble and we should expect those numbers to degrade in the coming months? Or can we actually get this like stagflationary period and the labor market stay strong, but people are being hurt uh, on the real wage front? Well, you, you put in a premise there. Um, I, I don't think it's a strong labor market. I think it's a broken labor market. <laughs> so if you look at labor force participation, it's pathetic. It's, it's bad. And so the fact that somehow labor and management are not meeting eye to eye to come up with 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 a, a working arrangement um, means that price discovery in the labor market is broken. I, I, I just it, I, I don't I would never call this a strong labor market. It, it, it I I'd call it tight, but it's tight because it's not working, right? The it, the food market is tight when there's no bread on the shelves, right? Same thing. Yeah. Explain a little bit more what you mean by uh, it's tight, but it's not working. Well, again, back to labor force participation. We've got a ton of people who are not working, and I can't even tell you why. It's it's a surreal thing. It's like if you walked out in the woods and there was no no birds and no squirrels, and you go, there's something wrong here, right? There's something creepy quiet. And, uh, and whenever I ask, um, in every establishment I go into, everyone, they look understaffed to me. Mm. And they act under staff, right? So you're getting lousy service. You're a Walmart. You can't find anyone to ask a question to, right? That sort of thing. You go to a restaurant. They're short of labor. They've got signs in the door, help wanted. And I ask them, where are your workers? Where did they go if they're not working here? And they always say, oh, somewhere else. But I haven't found this mystical, mystical employer. Uh, they just... And I don't know how they're putting food on the table. So I'm just completely and utterly baffled. If someone knows, send me an email, dbc6 at (laughs) cornell.edu. You know anything about anything that I don't know about, send me an email. My email box is a shit storm, but you know, can't get much worse. So when when you look at the labor market, uh, every restaurant that I go to, uh, I ask two questions, you know, how much have prices increased uh, here? It's never 8.5%. It always tends to be (laughs) teens or higher. Uh, And then also uh, I see the help wanted signs uh, on top of it. And I always ask, well, how much have you tried to raise the pay in order to elicit uh, applications? And so there's a restaurant here uh, in Miami that uh, I recently was talking to, and he's like, I need dishwashers. And he said, I used to be able to pay, you know, $10, then it was 12, then it was 14. He's like, now we're offering 18, can't get anyone. And he has no clue. He, he's just as perplexed as you are in terms of where where did everyone go? Why is it that we've increased uh, over the last you know three years or so from ten dollars to eighteen dollars, and we still can't get anyone to fill the role? 
And so I, I thought that was really weird. $18 for a dishwasher uh, feels like a high price given maybe where we're all anchored. But then I went and I started to look at other uh, average wages. And Amazon, for example, the average Amazon worker gets paid over $17 an hour. They're paying some people, you know, $20, $22, $24. And so it feels like wages, although they are going up in aggregate dollar amount, they're not keeping up with inflation, but it's a very different story than maybe what the mainstream talking points are of like, you know, Amazon screws over their workers. Like politicians are trying to implement $15 an hour. Amazon's paying 17. It just feels to your point, like I'm confused and I don't know why I'm confused, but I don't understand what's happening. Well, the one theory I heard from a, an uber smart, an uber famous guy. And I never know whether I should name a name or not, but um, you'd know him if I said his name. Um, he uh, had him over for dinner and, and he pointed out two important things. One is he said that um, unrelated, but still worth putting in your quiver uh, that $18 trillion worth the US debt is gonna roll over in the next two years. 18 trillion, 18 trillion. Um, and then he said that uh, he thought that maybe it was during the lockdown, the, uh, the, the illegal aliens had to go home because there was nothing here. And then they haven't made it back. Mm. Uh, that, that's, it, it strikes me as a funny trickle up economics, right? These guys were kind of off radar. But if, if all of a sudden there's a couple million people missing, then, this, then you're playing uh, – you know, some screwy game at Connect Four or something, where it's 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 the patterns are changing. I don't know. Yeah, well, one of the uh, the the themes, I don't know, maybe through the end of last year was a great resignation. All these people were quitting their jobs, even into the beginning of this year. Uh, and what I don't know how to measure, but it feels like a lot of these folks went and they created jobs for themselves, but they're not actually creating what we would traditionally think of as a business. And they're also not going and filling other open roles. So an easy example would be uh, if somebody leaves their job and they start uh, a Substack newsletter, which seems yeah, really yeah, there's, small. There's a real wealth creator, huh? Right. Well, well if, you th- if you think about it right now, all of a sudden it's like, hey, I have all this freedom and we, you know, we'll get into kind of the, the pros and cons of the freedom of movement and the freedom not to go into the office versus like how much money you make and, and uh, kind of your ability to in- invest capital and, and uh, reach financial security. But it, it just feels like there's a lot of things like that, but it doesn't feel like there's millions of people who did that. So it's still, even if you account for these, you know, kind of non-traditional jobs or these non-traditional, uh, essentially company creation, creations, there's still a ton of people missing from the labor force that no one seems to be able to find. Well, <clears throat> the worst I heard is I had a couple of guys deliver a washing machine. Um, and I asked them that question. And one of them said he, he actually is, he's a truck driver. And he just muscles the washing machine, big burly guy. <clears throat> he he is up from Georgia and they put him in a hotel at night and he drives a truck around New England. And uh and and I, I asked him where is everyone? And he said they're trading Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I go, well, that's really gotten profitable over the last few months. Um so in any case, uh, I, I don't have an answer. I, it really is a mystery to me, and it it's but it but it tells me something's broken, right? There's something so eerie and creepy in, in the world. And, and uh, it, it's just one more log on the bonfire of why the hell is the world what it is. I, I, I've just never felt, it feels like I, I'm in some sci-fi movie or something. Yeah, when, when we switch from labor force, maybe we look at uh, things like shelter, the CPI uh, calculation, 33% of it is uh, shelter. They still are estimating that it is uh, non-existent, 5% increase or something year over year. Uh, right. But real estate prices are up you know, near 20%, rents are up near 20%. Uh, so the first question you know, that I always ask is like, how do they calculate shelter if uh, rent and real estate are both up 20%, but they say it's up five? Uh, but is this just a continuation? Like as things get confusing, as things break across the market, we'll continue to see bad data and we'll also continue to see uh, parts of the market that used to be uh, very important and very well understood. We should expect to just have less and less understanding moving forward. Well, this gets to the question of the, 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 uh, <clears throat> the uh, housing and, and rental markets being either uh, – 
broken or, or are having changed profoundly in the last decade. And so we go through that great building boom from from around it started around 1998 um actually the first writings of a subprime crisis were in 98 i wrote about in 2002 i thought the banking system would collapse soon it took five more years um but then what happened is we get the collapse and then the question is okay so you have this massive inventory of houses where did they all go and and who bought them and why why was how did that inventory get absorbed and, and this gets to a theory of, of uh, some off off Broadway thinkers who say that that it was actually sort of a, a hostile takeover of the housing market by permanent capital. So um, so they say the housing bubble is bigger now, but you don't see the froth in the housing bubble. Yeah, I mean, the fact is, you know, they're all cash deals and, and there's people bidding like crazy, but but you don't have the condo flippers. You don't have the crazy. You don't have the people. You don't have the euphoria. So it doesn't feel the same. What I think happened and the number that I've, I'm about to quote a number that uh, that was from a credible source, but it's an incredible number. And that is that um, I think permanent capital bought up all those houses. So big, huge tranches of money coming out of BlackRock and places like that. Um, and I think they scooped it all up. Now, uh, single occupant, single, single family dwellings are a terrible, terrible business. And the only way you make the, it a good business, you know, you're supposed to make something like one seventh of the the cost of the house per year for it to be profitable, right? That's a historical number and, and no one's getting that. So, so the question is, how's it working? Well, it turns out you, you get there by getting cheap capital and, and, and heavy leverage. And what I heard was, is that BlackRock, who, who clearly was scooping up vast, vast swaths of single family housing and buying up companies who are scooping it up and stuff like that. So you had these, these aggregators, it's sort of like in uh like in Russia where you had aggregators of the Russian chits after the Berlin wall fell, and then people would buy the chits off the aggregators. And so BlackRock I heard was, was getting uh, money at 0.15%. So if you can, if you can make 0.15% on a rental net um, above 0.15%. So if you can make 0.3%, then you've got a profitable business. Now that's just absurdity, right? That's just that's just a broken market again. And so at some point, I, I'm a big believer that regression of the mean is a force of nature. I, I got an argument with someone say, oh, the markets can just keep going up. I said, no, no, they can't. They 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 won't. They that you know the credit cycle will end. Everything will end. Everything comes to an end. And and it starts all over again. And someone shakes the damn at your sketch and we all end up paying for it. Um and and we we will have a bust and and i think what's going to happen is again i've mentioned this several podcasts so i feel like i'm recycling here but um different the, the overlap of podcasts is so small um i i i uh, i have two black swans in my skull and obviously they're not my black swans because they're in my skull so they can't be a black swan but i think for the average investor there'll be a black swan and one is that the fed grew a spine and and is not going to stop now the equity investors really ought to be troubled in general because it seems clear to me that the fed is going to keep hiking until something breaks now people forget what something breaks mean their defaults their 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 collapses their their world comms their enrons their 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 bad things and and those were during a, a generic collapse then you get to the big collapse like 0809 i think this one will be bigger i i, I think the next one will be bigger than 0809 and part of it's because the inflation is going to box them in so so the fed's going to keep hiking until it breaks and breaking doesn't mean a 20 percent drop of the dow breaking means broken bones right icus this is this is what they'll do and so as long as the markets keep going up and as long as the collapses are not showing up yet um then then i don't see a mechanism by which the fed will stop and and again i finally got an answer to a question i didn't have for a long long time is you know guys like james grant say 20 percent of s and p are zombies 20 percent of the s and p can't pay their 
their, their interest payments with their cash flow. These are the 500 biggest companies in the United States, and they can't pay their interest payments with their cash flow. Now, to calibrate you, if you go back to the late 90s, I think it was the late 90s, but somewhere in the 90s, the zombie count was, was 2%. And the interest rates for 9%. So this shows you how out of whack we are. So when those guys break and, and 100 of the S&P 500 can't pay their interest payments and the Fed is boxed in by horrible inflation, what's going to happen? I, I just don't know. But I think, I think there'll be a lot of people being brought in on their shields, carried off the battlefield. So when you look at this, you mentioned that the Fed has grown a spine. Obviously, uh, they've talked. I'm to not sure they have. That's that's black. That's black swan number one. Okay. I don't know if they have, but now black swan number two is that they they pivot, as they like to say, and and it doesn't work. And all of a sudden, the metrics just keep doing what they're doing, and and things go bad, and you find out that the Fed is finally out of ammo. And the, the way I like to describe this, you know, the 40 year credit cycle is a it is a that's that's a typical length of a credit cycle, supposedly. I, I you know I'd have to ask Lacey Hunt to fill in those details, but um, but but credit cycles are very long and sluggish things, and if it's over, then the game's over, right? The, the whole equity game is over. Um, we're going to go through a tough period, and um, and so uh, again, eighteen trillion rolling over. Who's going to buy all that debt? What I just don't, I, I have trouble picking. This is stage four cancer. And, and, and you say, well, what do you do? And the answer is you put your affairs in order. Yeah. Uh, when, when you look at it, if the Fed, let, let's go through both these scenarios. If the Fed did grow a spine and they continue to hike rates, how high do you think the rates can get? before things would break, right? There, there's a lot of folks who say, hey, they can't get to five or 6% interest rates because you know the US will default and the system will break and, and kind of all these problems. How, how do you just think through maybe how high could it actually go? Well, it could be they're already there and it's just time now, right? It could be that the, that remember in, um, in 08, 09, I, I literally told my class in March of 2007 that I thought the banking system was about to collapse. And, and this was not me analyzing spreadsheets. This is just reading smart guys. And, uh, and, 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 but most people couldn't see the cracks. The housing market cracked in, 0, in, in 06. And so the housing market had already peaked. And so that game was over. And so that was a systemic problem. And, uh, and, but it, it, took, it takes markets and takes things. You know, if you put it, 20 pound block of ice out on the street in 95 degree weather, it wouldn't just turn to water. It, it takes time. There's kinetics to the process. So it could already be there. Um, but the Fed will keep hiking because the Fed will keep hiking into uh, until the breaking occurs. And that's why they overshoot because there's a lag, right? It's like driving a, driving a car with loose steering, right? You, you go to turn and it doesn't respond right away. So you turn harder. Next thing you know, you're fishtailing. Yeah. It, it, uh, it reminds me a lot of last year, they were still conducting QE and still suppressing interest rates. And we had 7% inflation, like talk about overshooting, uh, just absolute in hindsight, insanity. And it feels like, uh, they are likely to repeat that now on the other end of the spectrum, uh, because they're going to wait till it breaks. And then it takes time for them to pivot. It takes time for the market to internalize that pivot and, and kind of work its way through so is this just now a game where the Fed will continue to overshoot in each direction as we kind of go through boom and bust cycles and there's just nothing they can do about it? Or do we need somebody to step in there and say, hey, let's stop the madness and prevent ourselves from overshooting uh, and try to look forward rather than look backwards in data? I don't know. Um, the thing we should, and this is not in isolation either, right? So- before we're done, we will have talked about all the fucked up things that might completely remove the control from the Fed, right? I, wars and famines and, you know, just there's so many ways the Fed, you can't, the Fed can't print wheat. The Fed can't print natural gas. The Fed can't print oil. Um, so, so, um, and so I, 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 
I, I'm at a loss to see how this plays out. This is, a, again, the stage four cancer model. I, I feel like it's it's game over, but I'm sitting there going, I'm having trouble picturing this whole death thing. You know, it's kind of not working yet for me, right? What, what do you mean it's game over? Is it game over in terms of like a U.S. default? It's uh, just so much stuff breaks in the system that it you know goes back to the, the analogy of like shaking the Etch-A-Sketch and we start over. What, what, what does that mean? I When I say game over, I mean, I think we're going to get a generational wake-up call. So the 40-year the credit cycle. So yeah, there, there's... A guy named Murray Stahl at Horizon Kinetics, who I've I've been following for years, but but I listen. I got invited to listen to one of their internal conference calls due to a friend at RBC, and uh, Murray's a genius. and And he said in uh, nine, early 1980s, two miraculous things happened. One is Russia was collapsing. They weren't done yet, but they were starting to, and they desperately needed capital and all they had were resources. So they just flooded the world with resources. China was coming out of its medieval period and, and they desperately needed capital. All they had was labor. So they sold labor dirt cheap. And so we've had 40 years of unlimited resources and unlimited labor. And, and, and he says, that's not to be repeated. I would add on top of that a 40-year credit cycle superimposed right on top of it, although it's possible the 40-year credit cycle somehow because of that, right? Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Volcker didn't slay inflation at all. Maybe, maybe, maybe those two miraculous things are what stopped inflation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and there's just things like that that, that that just keep occurring. We started with, um, we started with interest rates at 16. They went below two 30-year rates. How and and you know if you if you use the Fed model, which I agree with at one level, I think the idea that somehow rates correlate with equity prices, where I disagree violently with the Fed model, is that you use interest rates to justify the equity prices because in that case you're not explaining it, you're justifying it, and and you can say all you can say well you know equity prices are fair value because interest rates are so low, and I go so you're gonna. You're going to justify interest rates, uh, equity prices, by comparing it to the biggest bubble in history, the biggest, the most gargantuan bubble in history. Uh, have a ball with that. But, you know, just because someone bought a Toyota for $150,000 does not mean I'm going to buy a Honda for one hundred and seventy, dollars right? It just doesn't work that way. You're still screwed either way. If we go to the other black swan of the Fed potentially pivoting, uh, midterm elections, I think, is one reason why people are saying, oh, they'll never go into the midterm elections with uh, high inflation or a recession. You know, shocker, maybe we'll get both uh, as, as we go to midterms. I don't buy that at all. I don't buy that at all. Explain. I, I think the midterm elections are already written down. I, I think, I think you know, the Democrats are desperately trying to achieve something, but it's probably not the midterm elections. So I think what you do is you let, I think, I think this is where you euthanize the patient. You let the Republicans grab control of Congress and the Senate and you, you just let it go. It's, it's too late, right? You're in a barrel. You're going down the Niagara River, you know, help do something. Sorry, it's too late. You're done. Yeah. So the, the midterms are right off. Unless they're not, at which point, um, did you see that, that election and flo- that recall vote in California where, where they were recalling one of, they say one of Soros's appointments. I always feel creepy saying that. And, and uh, they discounted. They threw out 30% of the votes. They threw the, the poll watchers out. They did the same thing over again. So, so if, if, if the midterm election somehow, if there's a you know, miracle on ice moment, and the Democrats managed to hold power. I will never believe another election. Yeah. It, it, I, I'm already not sure I will ever believe another election. I think they've been playing capture the flag for years, actually. But but the, the, the anti-Trump one of 2020, I, I'm a big believer they rigged it. I, 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 I would comfortably bet. Yeah. To me, it's a lot. It would be a lot safer bet than an S&P index fund to me. Ex- explain that more in terms of like, why are you so confident? Well, first of all, I think the data is there. Some more stuff came out with the, you know, 2000 mules, but I, I, I watched it. I read about it. There's just so many things that just didn't make sense to me. And then on top of that, the, 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 the drop dead argument is that they've done everything imaginable to take Trump out at the kneecaps, right? Everything imaginable. They've corrupted the FBI. They've done everything, but they forgot to rig the election. I don't think so. 
I, I find that not even imaginable. They rigged them. Yeah, I, I don't doubt it. And and people say, well, there were 61 court case. They didn't win any of them. They never made it to evidentiary standards. None of them. That's the rig. The rig is that not a single case went to court. They yeah. ended up in the courtroom, but didn't go to trial. Did they never got adjudicated? So one of the things that I've asked folks uh, on both sides of this, right? Some people believe, hey, I can't trust it. Some people say, you know, that those are the results. Is I always ask. Well, it's uh, both. That's both. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, well, and what I say to them is, I say, listen. Um, do you think that 100 percent of people who have voted in every single election, there's been no errors? And people always say, oh, no, oh, but it's worse than no, it's worse than that, though. I mean, that that's that there's going to be screw ups, no matter what dead guys have been voting since they started voting. Right. Um, but but I think it was wholesale. I think it was I think it was so in advance rigged where um, where they they made sure that they didn't go to bed that night wondering who would win, that they made sure that 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 they would have the votes by morning and uh and 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 the mail and ballots and the whole thing was set up perfectly for the rig. So now, so this is the big difference in, in my opinion, right? Is to your point about like dead people have been voting in elections forever, right? It's usually yeah, that's just been noise. Yeah, it's usually been such a small percentage that it doesn't sway the outcome. And uh, I think most people they don't like to think about it that way. It's true in every country. You're trying to get millions and millions of people to all cast some you know votes on something, and and so that happens. Whatever. Yeah. What you're talking about, though, seems to be something that is much more uh, malicious, nefarious, uh, planned. Total deep state. Total deep state. Okay. So, when so here, here's, let me let me dial it back, though. WikiLeaks had emails about election rigging. There were emails that suggested, I can't remember which of the two candidates won Pennsylvania because of rigging that came out of a WikiLeak or something like that. But years ago, when I think when Bush Jr. was running, um, there were, YouTube was filled with with computer scientists showing how you could rig a machine in a heartbeat, right? So that again, but that's kind of the the capture the flag baloney stuff. That's just kind of the the gaming that they do. And since both candidates were pre-vetted, it didn't really matter. They didn't care who won, and it was probably relatively balanced battle. Um, but 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 I think it was during the Bush election, the CEO of Diebold, which controlled the voting machines at the time. Um, was a Bush fundraiser, a big one. And, and there's just no mechanism that, that that's legit, right? That, that just shouldn't exist. If you're controlling the voting machines, you should shut your mouth and stay out of it. And, uh, and then, of course, the voting machines rolled over to, um, to Dominion. Now, here's the, the horror story of Dominion. Dominion's a Canadian company. And you go, okay, so a, for, a, a foreign sovereign state controls our voting machines. That makes me nervous, although I'm not sure I trust them any less than, than we controlling our voting machines. But it turns out Dominion, um, the Dominion um, uh, CEO had done big favors for, for, for the Biden. He was involved in the Biden transition. And, and then you say, okay, that's a problem. But then you find out Dominion's actually a subsidiary of a subsidiary of UBS. And you go, okay, that's a problem. Therefore, it's not only owned by a sovereign state, but it's not even Canada. And then you find out that that subsidiary is largely owned by a company in Beijing. So our voting machines are owned by Beijing. And that, then the plot thickens when you remember that the voting machines, the voting system was 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 connected to the internet that night, and a lot of people don't know what that means. What well, means that from across the world they could they could change all the votes. Is this something that moving forward will always now be part of the conversation? Like the United States uh, historically was uh, the legitimacy of elections, the legitimacy of various organizations. It was taboo. It, it, it wasn't even a conversation uh, without somebody saying, you know, go put your tinfoil hat on and sit in the corner. Now, I see it on every mainstream side. I see the Democratic, you know, mainstream conversation. I see the Republican mainstream conversation. It feels like the conversation across the board is very, very different in 2022 than it was in 2019 uh, before a lot of this stuff happened. Well, so, you know, I'm, I, I certainly lean right. But that's not to say that I like Republicans. Um, and, and so I voted for Bush Jr., who I didn't like, 
uh, the first time and not the second time because he, he fucked up completely, right? He, he, he got us into a war. He killed upwards of a million people and it was all baloney. And so that, to me, I've, I've for years have been put in, in the war crime category. The weapons of mass destruction was a complete ruse. You know, you can't let a guy get away with that. I mean, the, he should be taken to the Hague for that one. Um, but um, I, I, I think people are reaching a point where they feel like they don't have anyone on their side. And I think that's where the populism is popping up. Populism is both left and right. Um, revolutions, which I think we're in, I think we're in a nasty one, actually, but it's, 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 it's under the surface, but it's real. They can come from the left or the right. And I think this one is coming from the left. So this is, you know, the whole critical race theory, the whole, the whole getting rid of religion, the whole, um, there's just almost every topic, the January 6 hearings, the, 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 the rigging the election. So, so to me, the left seem like the guilty party largely now. And the right look like they're being responsive. They're, they're just getting irritated. Um, I think January 6th, the moment was optically ugly. I think January 6th, the response to that moment is, is horrific. Explain that. So, uh, well, there's several layers that I mean, one is the role of the FBI on January 6th is, is undeniable. We just, we don't have good numbers, but you know, someone explained Larry Epps, right? But there were many, many more. There's an estimated 80 co-conspirators who didn't get indicted, who certainly look like feds. When, when the smashing of the windows and the, the smashing of the doors and the damage and the rallying is done by feds, what, what kind of a country have we become? And so then, great example, QAnon shaman boy, right? He's nuts, right? They say he's unstable. I go, what, what gave you that idea, right? <laughs> he's wearing a, wearing a Viking helmet. Um, he broke nothing. He walked through an open door that had been opened from the inside. He, he, he hurt nobody. And he got, um, I think it was four or seven years in prison. How do you get that? I don't understand. I, I can't, I'm not even sure what crime he committed. I'm sure there's some trespassing crime, but that's, that's, and that's the Democrats. So you guys can rot in hell. You, you Democratic operatives who did that to that guy and who put, you know, what, 700 people in prison in solitary without trial for the longest time and, and threatened, you know, 20, 30 year jail sentences and stuff like that. I, I hope you eat shit and die. I, I, I would, I, I, it's, you go any further than that. I, I think it's lock and load time by the red states. Is this something where, um, both sides of the aisle are just ratcheting up the response to each other? And what no. I mean by that is you, you see, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't know. You see the language used, you see the constant like one upping of each other. And maybe some of this is just like social media polls to the extremes. Uh, but then also you're starting to see action as well. And you can see something like, I don't know, uh, Ron DeSantis going after Disney. And then you see something like, uh, Gavin Newsom, uh, doing things in California that is causing people to leave the state. And, and you just kind of see these different, uh, things. And, and I think to the people who like to believe that they're rational or, or somewhat centrist, they say to themselves, like, the world is going crazy. And like, I'm confused as to how we got here. This episode is brought to you by Eight Sleep. Good sleep is a game changer. And the Eight Sleep pod is the best sleep machine. I sleep on it every single night. A great night of sleep allows you to be healthier, be more rested, and have more energy throughout the day. And on the brand new 8 Sleep Pod 3, you can sleep as cold as 55 degrees Fahrenheit or as hot as 110 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the secret of thermoregulation. Better sleep, better energy. Get yourself an 8 Sleep. You can go to 8sleep.com slash pomp today to go ahead and get $150 off your order. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Not only do I sleep on it every night, it literally changed my life, and I begged the founders to let me invest in the company. 8sleep.com slash pomp. Go get yourself an 8 Sleep pod and get a better night of sleep. I, I See, I th that's why I said the Republicans are being responsive. Um, I see... I see um, I see um, the Democrats 
as the ones who are taking it to the next level every time. Right now, that's why I clarify between you know left and right based revolutions. But uh, to me, the Republicans look like they're playing defense. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. Uh, so so the whole thing at some level started from the Republicans many years ago. I think Gingrich turned politics ugly. I think I think he decided it was time to take off the gloves and start bashing people. So I think the Republicans get credit for for starting the brawl. I think uh, as much as Clinton's a sleazeball sociopath, I should clarify, Bill Clinton's a sleazeball sociopath. Um, not that they're not both, but it was an ambiguous sentence. Um, uh, that's not good. We have a president who's accused of being a rapist. I did, we have a president who's accused of having a body count, right? This is, this is a problem. But, but, but even with that said, you know, like the Republicans going after him on a perjury charge and stuff like that. These are procedural things. And I, I so in many ways, Republicans started it. Um, but now the Democrats have picked up their A game. The censorship is coming out of the Repub- out of the left, right? The censorship is all left wing. I, I don't see Republicans censoring the left. At all. So again, send me an email. If 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 trying to stop teaching gender theory to five year olds is censorship, then I guess you can stretch the definition. But um, but if I was a parent with a five year old and the kid came home and told me what they're teaching their that kid in the school, I I did you see the guy who got hauled out of a town a, a, a school board meeting because his daughter had been raped in a bathroom by a transgender? No, I did not. Yeah, so he's the school board meeting. His daughter had been raped by a transgender, and the school board tried to hide it. Now, they have obviously eventually got the guy, and it's a guy, right? If you're raping girls, you're a dude, right? You, you, you can pretend all you want about the others, but the, the rapist, <laughs> there's something wrong there. And anyway, he goes to the school board, he's mad as a hornet, and, and they haul him out of there. The cops haul him out, and I'm going, I, I, I'm amazed that he took that avenue to get to the school board. I, I, I'm still, I'm, I'm actually baffled we're not seeing frontier justice, vigilante justice. I, I, my daughter gets raped, someone's gonna die. Yeah, there, there is, um, I, I forget the name of the, the person now, maybe we can, uh, we, we can pull it up uh, in a second or, or look it up. Uh, but I think there's a UFC fighter who someone in his family uh, was sexually uh, assaulted uh, and maybe even raped. I, I can't remember exact details, uh, but he went after him and, uh, right. and, and ended up getting arrested. Um, and and if you're in the jury, if you're in the jury, you're going to convict that guy? I, no. I, I, I tend to think that no. uh, uh, if you're the prosecutor, no. you don't want to go to a jury. <laughs> well, but right. if the prosecutor's a left winger, mm-hmm. you don't know. This yeah. is the problem. And... Uh, if if you're, or should I say dishonorable, how's that um, to be more fair? Then there's the guy lone survivor, right? Remember the, the, the Navy CO, who, the only survivor of a, of a, of a, a, a raid in Afghanistan or something. Yeah, Marcus and, um, and, and some guy shot his dog. Yep. So he hopped in his truck and he's chasing him down and he called the cops. He said, you got to help me here. Cause if I catch him, I'm killing him. Mm-hmm. And the cops intervened and got him. And the guy got something like three years in jail which is exactly what the hell should happen. Yeah. Right. That, that's, I know that any, now, but, but these guys didn't know what they were doing. They were just punk ass kids. But, 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 but that is, there are, there are crimes to me that are, that on paper are not as bad as they are in reality. So if you shoot your spouse, who knows what the story is? But there, there are things that happen where you go, oh, that that really, they don't even have to be capital offenses. I go, but that's that's deeply bad. So yeah, well, one of the um, the pieces uh, that seems to be missing from the mainstream uh, conversation around you know guns, uh, crime, all this. Uh, remember in the Indiana Mall, there was a I think he was like a 22 year old kid. He I think the way the story was told was he was sitting in the food court uh, with his girlfriend. And a guy walked out of the bathroom, started shooting people, and it was in like he plugged him. 18 he plugged seconds, him. Yeah. right? In 18 seconds, he pulled out a gun and he took him down. And he, uh, he was a nationally ranked marksman based on, based on his performance. <laughs> From 40 yards, he hit him yes. seven out of eight shots and, and, with a handgun. 
And, and, and you look at that, and again, like, I, I'm always careful in that I don't think anyone uh, wants to live in a society where uh, we basically return back to, like, the OK Corral. We just, you know, hey, let's meet at right. high noon right. and everyone pull out guns and start firing at each other. Uh, right. But it does bring a point of um, there's the gun control debate. There's also uh, the armed citizens being able to protect themselves. And then I think you start thinking of these like sanctuary cities or, or these kind of uh, decriminalization from the prosecutors versus uh, actually having the laws changed. And it gets in this weird world where you start to say like, this is a very complex issue. But I think if we focus on the majority of citizens want to live in a safe society where they can go about their business and they are not worried about getting robbed getting their things stolen, uh, or having to deal with violence on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot of the complexity starts to look a little bit more clear as long as we agree like that is the goal. But when you hear some of these people talk, I don't know if that is the goal. Like it, it, there seems to be other goals that are competing with just like, let's create a safe society for the average citizen. Well, so the, so, so the overarching theory um, that covers all these concerns of ours is that someone's trying to destroy us. Do you believe that? Uh, well, certainly. Well, let me ask you this. Are we trying to destroy Putin? Depends who you ask. Right. If you ask me, the answer is yes. And, uh, and so there's no reason to believe that there's not quid pro quos around the world. Um, there's no reason to believe that China isn't necessarily trying to rot their system. You know, the United States has become a pretty serious bully. Now, I know that there was an upside to it. I'm reading a book right now by Peter Zihan. I think that's how I pronounce his name. And he's, a, he's an ex for guy, um, which is the, the intelligence analog of Blackwater. Um, and, 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 and he talks about this sort of thing. And, and it's, I lost my train of thought, but, but in any event, um, yeah, I think I think there are groups that are trying to undermine the United States, so we quit. Oh, the point being is is that the arrangement we had post war is the United States would keep the peace and that would promote global trade. Right? The United States at times is not keeping the peace. Mm -hmm. I, I mean I, I get it when I got into it over Ukraine, you we can go to Ukraine. I, Ukraine the Ukraine story is a total mess. I, I don't think I don't think any part of that story is true. I, I think the entire the mainstream media's presentation of the Ukraine story is just I think it's just fictional. What, what do you think? And, what what parts of what they're telling us do you think are inaccurate or, or erroneous? The pressure their lips were moving. <laughs> um, the um, <laughs> as soon as Ukraine showed up and right away, you picked up the, the propaganda, right? It was like, it was like this gets slathered with, you know, sausage gravy. And, um, and so what, what I did is uh, I'd always been someone intrigued by Putin. Um, and I went back and I binge watched everything Putin. I, uh, I, uh, I went back and read articles about Ukraine that, that were pre-2022, which, which, which one could argue are going to be more accurate because they're not trying to justify a war in Ukraine. And what you discover is the, 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 the constant conflict between NATO and Russia. And here's what I'll tell you from binging Putin. Putin uh, Putin's a tough guy. There's no chance that a guy who's not a tough guy can run Russia. So if you somehow think, you know, uh, uh, you know, Justin Trudeau is going to run Russia, you're dreaming. Um, he when he answers questions. He is unbelievably direct and and you listen to him, you go, that sounds truthful. It, it just it, it, there, there was just no sugar coating. And, and so he, he, he gets asked about you know, dealing with oligarchs. And he doesn't say I whack them because, right? So he doesn't fess up to everything or I lock them up because. What his response to dealing with the oligarchs is they robbed Russia blind and they did. They absolutely robbed Russia blind. But, but so, so when you listen to Putin, you go, God damn it. This guy is to the point every, he doesn't duck questions. His, his answers don't seem evasive. Well, every once in a while, you, you sense one that he doesn't want to put an answer to, but for the most part, they're good. 
Then you start reading about about NATO and when the the wall collapsed, you know, NATO made all sorts of promises to Russia that they wouldn't, you know, try to scoop up all these all these states um, surrounding Russia. And they, they had told Russia that. Why? Because, well, NATO's sole purpose is to oppose Russia. So, so if you if you want to say, well, Putin, you know, this bullshit about the existential risk, I go, when you've got this entire organization of countries whose sole purpose is to oppose your country, that in itself is existential risk. Now, they don't have to be acting in a risky way, but it is existential risk. Now, every time Russia gets attacked, it gets, it's been attacked by Armies moving through Ukraine. Ukraine is to Russia as Mexico is to us. If we, if Russia was putting troops on the border of Mexico, how many seconds would it take for us to bomb the living piss out of them? The answer is, uh, I, I don't think you'd even see the flash. I, I think it would just be over. And um, and so, but where the real problem came is that Putin repeatedly, repeatedly said to NATO, you can't have Ukraine. And, and you can say, well, he doesn't have the right to say that. And I go, well, we said you can't have Cuba. And we've said all sorts of things you can't do. And when I really get desperate arguing with a, the Ukrainian weeper, um, and I feel terrible for the Ukrainians. They're going to get slaughtered. There's no question the victims here are the Ukrainians. This is an awful situation. But I don't get lost in that part of the story. The story is that it's NATO versus Russia. And, and, and when I really get frustrated, I say, okay, in the last 20 years, which country has bombed out more other countries and killed more people, Russia, the United States? And, and they go, oh, uh, you know, they make up some argument about, you know, why we did what we did. And I said, okay, we, Obama bombed seven Muslim countries. Which of those countries attacked us? He bombed seven of them. Which of those attacked us? The answer is none, none. So why is that not a war crime? When we elect a liberal Democrat, are we supposed to stay out of wars? One of the basal things you might hope to get out of a liberal Democrat is not be in wars. Well, we apparently didn't do that very well. So we've killed millions. So statistically speaking, the United States is a bad guy. Statistically speaking, you, you can't make a case against it. So then... Putin approaches NATO repeatedly and says, look, it's existential risk for us. So sovereign states have issues that aren't necessarily backed by legal, uh, world legal tribunals, but they have issues they got to deal with. And so when we're talking to Russia and Russia's talking to the United States, which is NATO, there's no difference. It's just the United States. Um, it's one thing for the two to say, to be negotiating, saying, well, we can't give that up or you can't have this or that or that. You're negotiating. We didn't do that. We said, we don't care. We dissed them completely. We, we completely dissed them repeatedly. And, and so when you're a sovereign state and you're facing what you believe to be existential risk, it doesn't even matter if you're right. If they say to you, we don't care about your feelings, you know, in a, in a marriage, that's a divorce. And in, in a battle like uh, we're facing in Ukraine now, that becomes a war. Now, on top of that, you had, you know, 100,000 Azov Battalion guys amassing in Mariupol, and the Azov Battalion's a bunch of Nazis. And the, the press will say they're not. You go pre-2022 and you find out, yes, they're Nazis. And you, you watch John Mearsheimer talks, and he tells you all about the Nazis. And Mearsheimer's brilliant, actually. Steve Walt, brilliant. There are smart guys out there saying this is 100% NATO's fault. This war did not have to occur if NATO had been able to behave itself. How much so of then the, how much of like the NATO uh, activity? I call it almost like uh, uh, flexing for social media, right? Yeah. Th th there's like this like mainstream conversation, and you almost are trying to score points on social media to some degree. Although not, you know, they, they don't count it in likes and retweets and all that. But society has shifted, and so there's not the um, I, I don't know. I call it like uh, top hat diplomacy. 
right? That we that we may have expected 50, 60, 70 years ago. And, and they weren't perfect, but there definitely was this element of uh, gentlemen's diplomacy, diplomacy to some degree. And sure, there was negotiations. They would listen. That there was a conversation. Uh, and yes, sometimes we did go to war, uh, obviously with the two world wars and, and, and things like that where there was disagreements. But it feels like this, to your point, is something else. Like it almost feels like an unforced error that just came from the lack of uh, diplomacy. And so naturally it feels like you get war and maybe we didn't have to get this. Well, it feels to me like there's cold warriors sort of calling the shots. And we're, we're, we're in theory not in a cold war. And so you, it feels like there's guys who just can't come to terms with the idea that we don't have to oppose Russia with every ounce of our being. I, I just don't see what Russia's done to justify this. They say, oh, they took Crimea. I, I mean, these are, these are border skirmishes by U.S. standards. What happened to the Monroe Doctrine? What about just saying, stay out of the, stay out of the Western Hemisphere, dudes? Um, and, and I just don't think it's our job to be patrolling the Baltic states, to be patrolling all these countries that, that are constantly changing borders, constantly, right? If you look at a map, you ever seen one of those dynamic maps where it shows the borders change over time? They're just flapping around constantly. It's Europe. It's, Europe is a gigantic pile of tribalism. And it's always been that way, right? German, Germany wasn't even a country until after the Middle Ages, right? Germany was just a bunch of bearded crazies running around the, the dark forest. Trying so, to invade ancient Rome. Right, right exactly, <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, they, they were the only ones who didn't get conquered. Well, when you think about um, Afghanistan and our, our withdrawal from Afghanistan, which uh, I think by most people's standards was botched at best, uh, how much of that fed into the Americans' lack of appetite to participate on the ground in Ukraine versus you think it's more of a generational, just it didn't matter if we had botched that or if we had withdrawn it at that moment. Uh, the American citizen doesn't have nearly the appetite for war that maybe we once had decades ago. Well, uh, the term botch, I would question because um, it was so bad that it'll, it had to be intentional. It really had to be intentional. I, I swear that you and I could sit around with a six pack and come up with a better withdrawal, right? In fact, we wouldn't need the six pack. I mean, the six pack would help. But, um, and, and so if you look at every facet of the withdrawal, they left the weapons intact, they left the keys in the ignition, they left pallets of $100 bills. Um, they left an army that they said would defend the country. There's no, and they lasted, what, about 30 seconds. There's no way the CIA didn't know that this army wasn't ready. There's no chance, no chance. They were on U.S. payroll. The second we pulled out, they were going to go off U.S. payroll. Guess what? You don't have an army if you're not paying them. And so, so nothing about it makes sense unless the idea is, that what it really represents is us saying to the Taliban, here are the keys, we're leaving your weapons, behave yourselves, here's what we expect, and there's money to put gas in the vehicles, and, uh, and uh, have a nice day. Now, the only thing I can't explain is why we had to do it in a way that was so humiliating. And that always takes me back to how do you know where the motivation comes from when the president of the United States is so compromised? And I know there's people who won't agree with that, but he had dirty dealings in Ukraine. He had dirty dealings in China. Who, who knows how many more he had around the world? Um, if someone says, do it and do it ugly, and, and they own you, you do it and you do it ugly, right? When we look at uh, the, I don't know, takeover of Afghanistan uh, by the Taliban uh, for, I don't know, the hundredth time as uh, empires have gone there and, and right. been unsuccessful. Uh, the two things that stuck out in my head, one was uh, a thought of history and another was uh, one that I read on the internet. And the thought of history was just in the first time that we gave the Taliban weapons, 
right? It, it just, this time was uh, more so they took them from us after we left them versus us literally sending them uh, to help arm the rebellion, you know, decades ago. Uh, but the other thing I read, um, and, and I, I want to say it was from Tim Kennedy, uh, who is a, a, a former uh, Special Forces sniper, or may still, still be uh, active, um, but, but maybe it was from somebody else. And he said, listen, we have on national television videos of the Taliban sitting inside a building. There's a bunch of them sitting there. I got a great idea. Let's just go drop a bomb. If we really, if we really, really feel like these people Sorry, are threatened, and we are at war dog. with them. Charlie, get the fuck out of here. What, <laughs> get the fuck out of here. You know, what, what, why during the withdrawal are we basically, uh, it appears to be getting more information, identifying where folks are, literally have a live video feed, all these different things, and we just walked away. And, and maybe that well, was part that, of the plan. That gets, that, that gets back to the fact that they could have turned it ugly fast. So, so, I mean, the surrealist moments of all were where we had U.S. citizens outside the the, the air Air Force Base fence that we're not letting in, and 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 they said, "Look, throw these people on planes, get them out of there." And 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 Jen Psaki saying, "Well, we couldn't identify who was who," and I go, "Since when has that mattered to you guys?" You're bringing in gazillions over every border, best I can tell. So, so, and then they said they got 90% of the people wanted to get out, out. And I'm going, that may be a good stat for a snowplow or something, but it, it's a bad stat for getting U.S. citizens out of a hostile territory. And, and, and they, they were so matter of fact about that. And then there was, then there's this question, if you know you're going to pull out, why would you let why would you give visas to a group of school kids to go on a big adventure in Afghanistan? Right. I, there's just nothing about the thing that makes sense. So, so when nothing makes sense and it means the model's wrong and you have to have a new model, my new model is, is that, and by the way, you know, you know, those, those U S citizens left behind. Have you seen any stories about the horrors that they went through afterward? Any? Mm, no, none. Right. They're as silent as that as they are on the Vegas shootings. Right. <laughs> My favorite. Um, and so so it's not what it it's not what we were told. And I don't know what it is. Right. I don't know. I, I, it, the layer of the onion they're showing us is not the right one. The layer of the onion I'm sitting at might not be the right one either. Yeah. There's times where when I'm talking to my brother. I go, we, we talk about, OK, which which event in history would you like the answer key to? Which is the one where you'd like to say, OK. Tell me what the hell just happened, right? When some people say 9-11, some would say, some would say, you know, Pearl Harbor, somebody, who knows what. But 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 there's there's these events. I, I don't even know if we know what history is anymore. I, I I've I've you know the, the the press has been owned by the military for decades, long before they officially became prostitutes. They were still uh, in bed with the military. And, and uh, it was considered the loyal thing to do. So, you know, during World War II, you know, the movie theaters were putting out anti-Japanese, anti-German cartoons. And you know, it's always been there, right? They, J Japanese had Tokyo Rose, you know, whatever. Um, but now it's gotten to the point where the press, this entire business model depends critically on whoring their way around um, propaganda. Explain that. Well, so the internet destroyed the press at some level. The conventional press got wiped out, right? And uh, and so, how are they paying the bills? And and it, it's no longer Dan Rather and Walter Cronkite going on TV and telling us um, what might not have been true, but we all were happy as hell thinking it was true. And on Sunday morning talk shows, you'd have five or six guys sitting around a table. And you got the sense that they were discussing um, important topics from different angles. And you had George Will with a super right wing thing and you had lefties. They would go back and forth and it was civilized debate. And you, you got the feeling that, 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 that they were sort of peeling back layers of the onion for us. And you, you get none of that now. You don't get it on Fox News. You don't get it on, on CNN. Um, to the extent I lean right, I like the lies coming out of Fox News better. Um, I think there's one journalist who looks like one conventional journalist who looks like he's trying to get it right. And that's Tucker Carlson. I think 
people think Fox is this homogeneous right-wing machine, and by no stretch of the imagination is it that. There's degrees, but there's the stupid talking heads who just are 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 propaganda machines themselves. Um, but 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 there's I, I depending on what time of day you're watching Fox News, you get a very different presentation of history. So um, so the press the press is the press is now subsidized, and I think that probably. Uh, they're kept alive by, um, by the political system, right? And um, they're kept alive by um, 75% of their ad revenues come from pharma. So if you want to know how the hell we keep not getting a straight answer on things like vaccines and COVID, all you have to do is recognize that, if, that pharma... My brother said something the other day that struck me as profound. You know, those TV commercials where they advertise a drug and you go, what the hell did they just tell me? Right. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of old guys walking around with smiles on their face. What drug was that? My dog is killing me here. And she doesn't take no for an answer. He doesn't take no for an answer. Um, and, and you don't know what the drug was and you don't know why, you know, oh yeah, I'm going to run off and take who the fuck cares. Uh, right. And, and it, it, you wouldn't do that. And, and he said, no, I, I think what they're doing is that they're just advertising as a revenue stream. So if you're a farm, instead of having a lobbyist, you know, you say, okay, look, just throw, throw them some fucking ads, right? Advertise our, you know, anal cream, right? I don't care what. Just advertise. And so 75% of the advertisement revenues are from pharma. Why? Because then when you have some big catastrophe like Viox or or Bextra or Nexium or any of there's so many. Um, what you do is you say, oh, by the way, don't cover that story. And they don't cover the story. You think oh, that's by happening? the way, you, you think it's oh, happening? Yes. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So you, you, was there on any TV show early on a debate about the pros and cons of vaccine? On any, on any mainstream press, did a bunch of smart guys sit around the table on Sunday and say, well, you know, what are the pros and cons of vaccine? Let's consider, you know, risks of vaccine. You know, people don't seem to know this. The history of vaccines is a horrifying history, not horrifying in terms of evil dudes, although there might be some of that, but just horrifying in terms of how hard it is to create a vaccine that doesn't slaughter people. It's a very difficult thing. And so there's books on vaccine production that predate COVID that talk about all the failures that occur and how they've got vaccines for things in the military, but they can't use them because it kills the, kills the guys. And, uh, and so making a vaccine is hard. Did anyone discuss that? Did anyone discuss in any way, shape or form how, did, did any of the press talk about, now, now you can hear it now, but don't forget this is just recently. It's as though they've said, okay, we're done now. So go ahead talk about it all you want. We don't care. But did early on, did anyone talk about um, vaccine injuries? Did anyone, which are absolutely real. Absolutely real. We just don't know the numbers because the authorities who would have to keep track of them, the, the big grand overarching group that would really be needed to keep track of all of them are a bunch of liars. And so they're not going to cover it. Nothing was covered. Uh, nothing but propaganda. And so this gets back to the frontier justice part. There's some, there was a story the other day I read about a woman about um, two. One is a, one is a husband wife team talked about the kid. The husband didn't want to vaccinate. The wife did. She took the kid to get vaccinated. He got wiped out by it. Um, you can imagine divorce court in their future. Another is where they had a kid who, who had serious autoimmune issues. Their doctor and the family all agreed they're not going to vaccinate. The kid goes to school and they bribe him with pizza and they vaccinate him and fuck him up royally. Explain to me why that father doesn't go and blow someone's head off. It's not that I think he should. It's not that I think it would be good. It's not. It's that I don't understand statistically how these things are happening. And somehow the only shooters we get are random shooters who kill random people for no apparent reason. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. The, remember the L.A. cop who declared war on the L.A. police department years ago? I, I don't want to guess at his name, but I, remember, I think it was Eric something. Uh, I do remember. And they, yeah, and they basically tracked them to they tracked them to like a cabin or something, right? I think he ended they up- They burned uh, him. They yeah, burned him. They set it on fire. Yeah. yeah. I read his manifesto. He was not insane. He was not a loner. He was not isolated. He cared about life. He just decided he'd seen enough. 
I, I don't understand. Now, let's go to Uvalde. How do you have, so here's a town that's town of 15,000. It's 50 miles from a nearby bigger town, 70 miles or 80 miles from a different one. It's in the middle of nowhere. And the number they say is they had 370 cops there. How do you get, how do you get 370 cops? I, I, I don't understand that. What were they doing there? Right. So right away, the story starts getting flaky. And then you've got 77 minutes where a bunch of cops won't go in. And you, so and the problem is the explanations don't make sense to me. So I say, oh, they're cowards. Really? I would think that you could pick 10 names out of a phone book. And one of those 10 would go in and say, fuck you. I'm not waiting. I hear gunshots. I'm going. And, they, and out, of, out of all these cops, no one went in until supposedly some border guard went in and shot him. Did, did, you, watch, uh, there, did you watch the hallway video? Yeah. I, I watched it. And, you know, again, uh, hindsight is twenty twenty, And so obviously we know what happened. But given that we know, and you're sitting there and you're watching it, your blood just boils. You, you just well, are the getting, problem you're is, just getting I don't so even think mad. That could be, I just don't think it could be true. What do you think? Now, it I is? don't have, I don't know. I, I, I have been bothered by all the shootings for years now. For years, I've been bothered. The shootings all follow similar patterns. Uh, the man on the street who gets interviewed minutes after it occurred are always talking about multiple shooters and they go away. And you know, all of a sudden, it's a single lone shooter. By the way, have you ever seen a detailed discussion of, of one of the shooters' lives? You ever seen anyone talk about what led up to it? What was the what was the setup? No, you see a drug addled kid in court looking wacky as shit, getting convicted, sent away or getting executed or whatever. And you get no insight. You get no backdrop. You get no no anything. And and um, again, my favorite, if you want to dig into it, the Vegas shooting was a complete fraud. Uh, I, it, 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 it's, it's the most extraordinary story. I wrote about 20 pages on it and I only got about 20% of the story. I, I don't the know. Vegas, I don't know much about that one. What, what happened? Well, what there's two it? documentaries now, which you can go on. If you go on rumble, rumble or bit shoot, you can't get it on YouTube because of course they won't let it be there. Um, and, and what happened is Steven Paddock supposedly shot, uh, some like 1500 rounds out of a 34 story window in the Mandalay Bay. Right. Um, right away, the chief of police who apparently wasn't given the plot in advance um, said, there's no way it's not humanly possible for one person to shoot this many rounds. And then within a day saying it's only one shooter. Um, but it turns out that there's, there's the documentaries. One of the things that I pick up right away is that they kept interviewing the same guy over and over and over. The, the networks were using one guy. There were 20,000 people there. But somehow a guy named Mike Kronk was the only guy who kept getting interviewed. And it, YouTube kept rolling to the next interview like it does, you know, 15 seconds later. And there's Mike Kronk again, new network, same guy. His story's drifting. It started out with him saying his buddy got shot three times in the chest. Now, a marksman told me from that distance, you can't get shot three times in the chest unless the guy's a sniper. And... And uh, because there's too much spray. And um, and then the guy, Mike Crock's talking about his friend sticking his fingers in his own bullet holes to stop the bleeding. I'm going, no, right away. That was my bullshit meter. That was my bullshit moment. And then you start listening to audios, which, by the way, were getting deleted off YouTube as fast as you could find them. Um, audios, you can just hear all sorts of weapons going off. Just tons of you know, that, 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 and whack, 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 whack. You know, you hear all these different guys took the recordings. They pulled all the different weapons apart, said, here, here's one that's superimposed on another. Here's one. And um, Stephen Paddock had no history of guns or anything. I think I think he might have been a gun runner. That's my suspicion. But I think he took the first first bullet. And the question is, um, and then there was, there's always the post thing that occurs. Remember in January 6th, when four cops committed suicide, and you go, what? Four cops committed suicide after January 6th. Well, there was a bunch of very strange deaths of people who survived the original shooting too. 
Like six or seven people out of 20,000 within a month were dead. And you go, what's that all about? I, I don't know. I just know. So if you find the, the videos, if you find the documentary on the Las Vegas shooting, I bet you to rumble and you watch it. I, you'll see the problem. There was shooting all up and down the strip. There was literally a lady walking through the crowd saying to people in 45 minutes, you're all going to die. I mean, just strange shit like this. And there's, there's, there's taxi cab footage where the guy's going, he's shooting out of the fourth floor window. I oh, shooting out of this, he's shooting out of that. There's video footage of the cops going into the room and saying, turn off your cameras, right? That's the favorite trick. And then one guy didn't turn off his camera and that survived. And they're in there and they're, they, they say there's no broken windows. Then you hear a window smash. I, it, it just surreal shit. It just doesn't make sense. So, and then the question is, okay, the biggest shooting since the Civil War. The biggest shooting since the Civil War. When was the last time someone mentioned it in their rally and cried to get rid of guns? Mm -hmm. Never. Right? You don't, you don't know shit about it because it's old and not, who cares? Well, the reason they don't care is because they botched it badly enough that, that it can't be used as a rallying cry. They don't want anyone looking. At it. The guy, the, you know, the guy got shot in the leg, the security guard who was actually on the floor where Paddock was. He supposedly got shot in the leg. Um, trauma surgeon said, by the way, these weapons do a, a special kind of damage. You'd bleed out just from a leg shot just because it turns your leg to jello, supposedly. But, but this guy gets shot in the leg. Next thing you know, reporters are trying to get to his house, and there's a bunch of cars without license plates in front of him. The house is protected. Next thing you know, you find out he has several social security numbers. Next thing you know, he's in, he's in Mexico. When asked about him going to Mexico, I said, well, he planned a vacation. I go, you know, I think letting him go to Mexico was probably not a good move. And then he comes back, he does one interview on Ellen DeGeneres, which is own her show's owned by Mandalay Bay. And uh, the whole story is nuts from head to toe. So here's the problem. Once you see one plot like this, if your moment was Pearl Harbor, couldn't have been Pearl Harbor the way it went down, um, you know, 9-11, whatever it is, once you, once you wrap your brain around one of them, there are no, there's nothing to constrain you from pondering crazy ass ideas. And so you can't say, oh, that would never happen. You, you can no longer say that. And there's just too many of these. There's, there's too many things that just don't make sense. You know, there's, I don't know shit about it, but, you know, the Israelis sunk one of our destroyers. And no one ever talks about that except for the guys who care about it. Um, you know, it, it, it's been going on since the dawn of time. The Lusitania was a setup, right? I, I don't think we started a war without some sort of false flag initiation of the war. I, I, so, I, Dave, let me, I, let me I ask think, you this question, because I think a lot of people who, who listen to this, right, that there, there's um, unfortunately, I'm probably melting their circuits, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately, in society, there, there's basically uh, a move to the extremes. Right. And so there's some right. people who I imagine are listening to this and they're sitting there shaking their head like, yes, he gets it. He, you know, he's he's talking about the things that I and believe I see. Nuts. And then there's others that, that are like, oh my God, this guy is an absolute insane, you know, uh, right. extremist, conspiracy theorist, right. et cetera. Mm -hmm. how, how do you balance um, maybe rationality when it comes to things that you are confused by? Because what I'm hearing you say, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, hey, there's a bunch of stuff that seems really weird, but I don't have the answer, right? It's not like you're saying, hey, the right. story you're being told is A, but really the story is B. What I hear you saying is I got details, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, and they don't add up to me. And now I'm confused and I don't know what to think. So how do you kind of maybe go through the world as we have so much access to information where there are a lot of things that don't seem to add up? Like, do you just sit and think about them all day? Do you just throw your hands up and say, oh, I'm not going to solve it. And like, let me move on to the next one. Like, how do, how do you kind of just navigate all this? Well, after a while, they, they get matter of fact. So I'll see something. I'll see some stat about the vaccine killing people. Like, oh, I I know I'm done. I, 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 I've, I've come to terms with, so I write about it, right? One of the things I do is I write about it. If, 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 if your ideas are incoherent, writing about it tends to reveal that. And now, it's not to say I, I'm not clever enough to write a plot. I did a podcast recently with a guy whose worldview and mine don't match up. And, 
and he knows a ton of facts. But, but in some sense, we all have like a Christmas tree and we hang the ornaments off it. We, what we do agree is that the world's screwed up. He just has, he, he has this sort of Davos leaning and I say, I, I think China's involved, you know, and we disagree on that. And, and the problem is you can reach a point where you've got a model that's robust enough that you can make anything hang off it. And it doesn't mean it's right. As a chemist, by way of background, I, I, I went into a very complicated field that some thought we'd never understand and some thought they did. And for 40 years, I'd, I've discovered over and over and over that what experts who are really trying to get it right got dead wrong. I, they, they, not, they, they asked the wrong questions. You wouldn't believe things where, where, where I, I, I could say to a freshman, here's why this isn't even possibly a valid argument, right? And you go, oh, shit, I hadn't thought of that. And so it's a very complex field and just 40 years of relentlessly showing that what people thought was not true. I'm finishing a paper right now in which there's probably 500 papers in the literature. I'll use the same mechanistic model to explain it. And it was uh, just in a different zip code when you actually dug into it. So I'm comfortable with the idea that experts can be wrong. And over the years, I've gotten comfortable with the idea that, that, that psychopathic people conspire. La last time we talked think, about this. Yes. Yes. Uh, how, you know, you know, you know, who's nuts. The guys who think that people who, who are in positions of power don't conspire. Those, those people need a CAT scan. I, they, 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 they just, there's just no chance. That's not true. Right. When, when you start to extrapolate this maybe to uh, financial markets, is mm -hmm. the same thing true, right? Well, that the, the non-financial markets are crazy. There's all these, you know, uh, uh, things that don't make sense. And then when we look at the financial markets, same thing. We saw major banks getting in trouble for uh, manipulating markets. We've seen, you know, issue after issue after issue. H how much of it's true in finance as well? Well, the finance, I, I, I don't, I don't get as dark in the sense that um, you see greed and corruption, but it's, it's, it's some level, it's kind of garden variety. It's on a massive scale. The other thing is there's, there's a non-trivial number of instances where what people attribute to nefarious dark forces are just 20 somethings in cubicles running markets around like crazy and just, you know, bidding it up and then bidding it down. And they're, they're committing crimes, of course, you know, they're spoofing and stuff like that. But um, the bailouts of the banks um, at some level, you say, well, of course they're going to bail out themselves, right? The, the, who wouldn't bail out yourself. And so uh, I, I think the markets, um, what has changed is that they've gotten so financialized. Um, I, I, on Twitter, you'd be hard pressed to find someone beyond Jesse Felder and John Hussman talking about valuations. I, I do it all the time. And, and the, the problem is, is valuation doesn't tell you anything about timing. So I've been ranting about valuations for a long time. I think valuations sort of escaped the gravitational pull of, of, of the earth or tried to escape it starting in 94. So I think we've been drifting further and further from what I'd call a credible valuation since literally 94. Why? Well, actually, I, I, I look at 25 metrics of valuation. I do every few years just to touch base. And in 2021, I did it. And, and you know, if, you're, if your favorite valuation is PE, may God have mercy on your soul, they can fake those like there's no tomorrow. Um, but I use 25 that have to do with price to book, price to revenue, price to you know, Tobin's Q, composite valuations, price earnings, you name it. Um, there's a whole bunch of them. And they all kind of point to the same number. Of about, as of the end of 2021, we're sort of 100 and... 10 to 150% overvalued, historical fair value. Now, what's noticeable is that if you look at all these valuation charts, and if people are interested, go to my pinned tweet, it's in there. Um, what's noticeable is they all seem to peel away from historical metrics around 1994. 
And, and, uh, and what you can see is that uh, corporate debt took off in 1994 and didn't look back. Um, corporate debt is a percentage of GDP, you know, normalized to things that, that shouldn't take off. Um, part, that's part in part the credit cycle, of course. Um, but but that now here we are with 20% of the S&P being zombies, right? And and if 20% of the S&P can't pay their, their debt with their cash flow, the S&P should be priced a lot lower. And um, and it's not, right? What happens when those 20% default on their debt? I don't know. Is, I, I is it possible? Back- is it possible for us to get there? Or is the constant intervention in markets obfuscating that to the background? And so, uh, yes, prices matter, but maybe we can't look at the historical measurements as like that's actually where we could fall back to? Well, then you can't look at historical returns either then. That got presented to me by my smart friend sitting at dinner that night and uh, he said, maybe your historical metrics are no longer valid. And I said, therefore, historical returns are no longer valid. If, if you're paying twice for a revenue stream than you used to pay, long-term sustainable is, is uh, you can't get a good return, right? Mm-hmm. It's like if you buy a, a 30-year bond right now, you know what you're going to get off that bond. You can trade it if you want. I'm not, I'm not a trader. I'm not talking about trading. Trading is, uh, trading is part of the problem, right? There's so much money sloshing around that it has become the market. Mm-hmm. But it's not about investing. And, and, um, and so if you buy a 30-year bond right now, what's the return on it? 3%, 3-something, three 5-something? I, I, I lose track of these. Um, the, I guess the 10-year is close to 3 Um Let's use the 10 year. If you buy a 10 year bond, it's going to return 3%. It's a predictable return. You've overpaid for that bond. Mm-hmm. Right. And if you think, oh, I'm going to sell it to some sucker, you go have a ball, but, but that's not investing. Yeah. And someone has to own that bond all the way to the end. What does and your so portfolio bond, look like now? Like, what, what's the makeup uh, percentage wise? Um, I did some jiggling at the end of 2020, actually. Um, my portfolio is probably 35 percent, maybe as much as 40 percent precious metals. Um, there's, I have some money in a, in a place that I count, but I don't control. And it's, a, it's an old man's, you know, 30, 70 fund sort of thing. And, and I have no say in it. And I, I count it at the end of the year. But um, so that's sort of generic. That's about one seventh of my wealth. Um, that was an inherited chunk. Um, I, I moved into energy at the end of 2020, which was an absolute bottom call. If that was the bottom, right? You never know what it's the bottom, but if that was the bottom, I nailed it. I didn't size it like Druckenmiller. So, um, I never do. I, I always average in and I, every once in a while, I say, I think it's probably a good time to add some more energy. Um, I think, I think we're looking at an energy bull market somewhere in the energy sector for, for decades. The problem is I don't, I don't know how to play it. I don't know if it's energy services companies. I, don't, I think you want to avoid energy companies that have to develop energy sources going forward in a big way, because I think, I think the politics makes that almost impossible now. So I think you want to, I think you want to buy energy companies in some sense are almost like royalty trusts where they've already got their pipes, they've got the refineries, they've got their, their wells, and they can keep pumping the energy out of the ground. Um, I, I have a lot of cash. That's, uh, that was fine. I didn't mind missing opportunity, but now the inflation is causing trouble. So that, that I've been desperate to, to figure out how to handle that. I own no Bitcoin, as you probably surmised. Um, it's not that I don't think it could do well. It's just not me. Um, I just finished Morgan Housel's book on the psychology of money. And he gets at that point very much. He says, what's, what's completely sane for you is insane for me and vice versa. That, that, that there's no right and wrong on some of these things. Some of these things are how you're wired. I'm, I'm not wired for Bitcoin because it would take me too long to understand it. And I would never forgive myself if I lost a bunch of a serious amount of money. And I, I, I would totally forgive myself for not buying it because, well, for starters, I passed on it at 10 bucks per coin. Um, 
and I would have sold it at 50 and then I would have been in psychotherapy for the next 20 years. Um, and, and then, um, yeah, a lot of fixed income sort of stuff. And when you look out over the next 12 months, 18 months, we started the conversation off with the Fed's going to continue to hike rates potentially if they did grow a spine until things break. Are you doing anything right. different now uh, or, or kind of preparing for worse times or, or just yes. the portfolio you have is the portfolio you have? Well, I am prepared for worse times. What What is different? And it's not different in, you know, eternity different. You know, it's not that this time it's different as in unique, although I would argue the markets are uniquely frothy. Um I would say they've uh, a new high watermark for crazy. Um, uh, what I'm preparing for, what I blew in 08, 09 was that I was totally ready for it. But I, I, I thought there had to be much more damage. And in defense of that view is that I don't think anybody could have foreseen the level of intervention. And, and, and remember when uh, the Fed essentially bailed out, um, bailed out the system by putting 30 billion into JP Morgan to take Bear Stearns, um, that sucked the oxygen out of the room, 30 billion. People were stunned by that. And now we're throwing trillions around, literally trillions. And so I would say that the Fed has gone completely out of orbit in terms of their willingness to intervene. And they, they just didn't do that before. And I, I did not see that coming. And so I saw, I saw what came out of the 09 low is just a dead cat bounce. I thought, I thought we we're going to be looking at a, a highly damaging 90% correction. And if you buy a 90%, if you buy a 90% correction after the first 50, you still <laughs> lost, let me do some quick math, 80% of your money. Or as Einhorn said one night at dinner to a tech bull, it's a well-known phrase, but this guy was too naive to know it. He, he said, you know, you know what a 90% correction is? He says a 90% correction is where you get an 80% correction, then it gets cut in half. He says, he says you have no experience with something that gets cut by 90% or 97%. Einhorn lit into the guy. And uh, what was the guy's response? The guy, he was just frothing at the high profit margins of, of, uh, of tech, not recognizing that that idea that regression of the mean is a force of nature and profit, high profit margins get scooped up and, and, and dealt with because if it's a high profit margin, competitors can jump in and cause you trouble. And, um, and so what you really want, my dad, when I was a kid, taught me, he said he went into a business that was capital intensive during the seventies, right? Where capital was expensive. And, and I said, why did you go into that business? He was a contractor, but this was a weird offshoot for him. He said, well, besides the fact, I think I can make money is that the, the, the fact that it's so capital intensive sort of protects me against a wildcatter. Because a, a shitty businessman can't get the capital to do this. And he says, I can compete with a, a credible businessman. We can both play in the same field. He says, it's the guy who undercuts me and destroys us both simultaneously that I can't deal with. So he was describing a moat, right? Mm -hmm. and, and capital constraint is a moat for those who have access to capital. Mm -hmm. And the, what the Fed did is the Fed took our savings which uh, used to be the capital, right? Savings was capital. And they said they took away that role of, of savings as, as capital. And they said, look, I, you, don't need to, you don't need to borrow from Dave. We'll lend it to you. And so they, 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 made, they, they started by making my capital worth less. And then they've reached the point where they're risking making it, causing my capital to be worthless. And as we watch everything play out around the world, uh, deglobalization seems to be a major theme. Uh, reshoring of manufacturing, supply chains, even potentially labor seems to be something that over the last two and a half years has become uh, a, a more obvious thing. What's the impact on financial markets 
uh, kind of like the macro trends for the next 10, 15, 20 years? Do you feel like deglobalization and, and reshoring of some of these things uh, will change where returns can be captured? Or is this still the same thing, just go buy great businesses uh, and don't worry about some of these uh, kind of macroeconomics, maybe like a Peter Lynch, you know, if you spend 15 minutes on macroeconomics, you spent 13 minutes too many. Uh, I think the globalization reshoring uh, will be massively inflationary. Okay, explain so, that. So, so I, I, you know, the, this Murray Stahl at Horizon Kinetics said the age of monetary policy is over. So that miracle Russian resources, Chinese labor, credit cycle of 40 years, um, that provided a tailwind for the equity markets. Uh, the boomer demographics, Peter Zeon is a total demographic account. And when your demographics are favorable, which they were for the last 40 years, then you've got this, this massive workforce just showing up and, and cranking shit out daily, right? And, and you have a relatively small percentage of the population who were consumers and only consumers. We're now heading into an aging global population, but certainly in the United States, but China supposedly is much worse. Um, where you got a growing number of consumers who are expecting to have things done for them and they don't, they don't have to pull on the oar anymore. They're re retired. And, uh, and so you're going to have demand for goods and services and, and a smaller number to provide them. That's a highly inflationary setup. So whatever your model is going forward, I think it better deal with that problem. And um, the other thing inflation does is it, it, it shifts money into the hands of the rich because 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 financialization certainly doesn't help joe six pack and and we could have all sorts of strife all sorts of stress all sorts of populism all sorts of dumb presidents right and so i, I it's it's not to say that it, it, it had charlie would you please shut up I'm getting you off. Go, go defend yourself. Um, wait a minute. Where the fuck is he? There he is right there. I got three dogs. Only one's being a pain right now. Um, this too will, shall pass, right? Yeah. But it's, but you know, I, you know, the depression was only 10 years. I, I argue the depression's 15. Um, I got an argument with a Stanford economist who said, no, no, you're wrong about that. I, I said that, you know, low consumption during World War II, blah, blah, blah. And he said, no, the, the GDP during World War II went up uh, 15%, something like that. And, and it, after about 10 years, I, I took him on in writing. I said, no, your GDP number is wrong because GDP should include depreciation of assets. So if you crank out a drill, you can get 10 years out of that drill. If you go to the movies, you get two hours out of that movie. So they just, they're not equivalent contributors to GDP. Um, and, uh, and World War II's GDP might have been rocking, but we were making battleships and bombs and planes and stuff like that. And the depreciation rate on those was measured in, in very short time scales. Now, what we did do during World War II is we, we had, made great progress towards improving mass production. So we took what Henry Ford did and we put it on steroids. And so that was the, uh, was what World War II left us with, was a highly functional economy in a world filled with unfunctional economies. And so, so we were wealthy at the end of World War II, but, 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 but World War II was, I think, the blow off of the depression, but it passed. So you say, okay, so this too shall pass. But people suffered. Right. Mm -hmm. World War Two passed, but people suffered. The Civil War passed, but people suffered. And so, you know, if you went and stomped on an anthill in your backyard, you could stop on it all goddamn day. And the next day you'd go out there and there'd still be an anthill there. But there'd be a lot of dead ants, too. Mm hmm. And I don't think, want to be one of those, right? And you think that's basically what uh, what is likely to happen here is that uh, this too shall pass, but there'll be a lot of suffering uh, for various groups in between now and then. That's right. That's right. I mean, we, de depression, unemployment was twenty five percent. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, there were parents giving away their kids. There were, I, it, it was an awful time for some people. Well, and, and you just don't want to be that person. So you have to prepare not to be that person somehow. Yeah. One of the things um, before we wrap up that, that I found uh, absolutely fascinating was back in 2020, uh, I think it was in the, towards uh, the middle or end of March, I wrote a piece and I said, um, unemployment could basically eclipse the Great Depression unemployment numbers. And this was the week before we got the first 6.6 million of unemployment claims in a single week, right? So right before it skyrocketed. Right. And uh, what I had done is I went and I just analyzed a bunch of different sources that I found that were telling me uh, at county levels or even at certain state levels uh, of layoffs and uh, of what they perceived to be uh, this incoming gigantic leap. And so it made me go look at the Great Depression unemployment numbers. And everyone knows the 25% number because that's the big headline number. But actually, it took three years before it got up over uh, 20%. I think it was something, you know, it was around uh, historic low, you know, kind of mid 3%. Then it jumped to like 8. Then it was like 15. And then eventually we got up over 20. And it stayed there for quite a while. It was like, I think it was three or four years where we were above 20% unemployment. Mm -hmm. And so the point that I was trying to make at the time was just like, look, you don't have to ever hit 25% to have as bad unemployment or worse than the Great Depression. And if you look back at the numbers, the official numbers from uh, kind of this COVID situation, we got to 14% unemployment in the United States, right? Well, well, even if you believe those numbers too, um, you would have a tough time arguing that 2020, that we created any wealth whatsoever, mm-hmm. right? We, we didn't produce anything. People weren't building houses. They weren't building buildings. Uh, things were shut down. Research programs and pharmaceuticals were shut down. Oh, there's wealth creation, maybe. Um, and, um, and, uh, and yet somehow at the end of the year, what was the market up that year? In uh, last year. 2020? 20, 2020, I think it was up like 15% or something. Yeah, and then in 2021, it was up like, I think, 28%, 30%, something like that. Right. That the market has to, at some level, track GDP. It's, it, you can't you you can't grow the market faster than you grow wealth, which is crudely speaking GDP. And and so, um, and the GDP numbers are sketchy. There's a great book, by the way, in case someone's still listening to our podcast, um, by Robert Gordon on wealth creation, and he said that 1870 to 1940 was a phenomenal period of wealth creation. There's these primary inventions like uh, electricity and things like that. And then there's what what he calls secondary inventions, which is, you know, appliances. And so they spin off. And he said, uh, oddly enough, the best decade ever for secondary inventions was the 1930s. We created a lot of wealth in the 1930s. Um, And, uh, and, um, and he said, then it, then it goes pretty flat. I, I got two dogs working me now. Then it goes pretty flat from 1940 to sort of 1970. And then, uh, and then he said, it's, it's, it just pancakes. The real wealth creation just pancakes like crazy going forward. He said, there was a blip from the decade from 95 to 2005, which was the tech thing. He said, but then it just flattens out again. And, and, uh, and, and he, he, draw some real interesting analogies. What is really transformational wealth? And you can say, ah, look at Amazon. Well, I would say more transformational than Amazon was the Sears Roebuck catalog. The Sears Roebuck catalog was was the prototype of Amazon. You got this catalog, you could order anything of any one of 10,000 things. Before that, you had to go to your your country store and buy nails out of a barrel and shit like that. And you could buy prefab houses and shit through the Sears Robot catalog, parts for your car. It was Amazon. Mm -hmm. So Amazon is not as transformational as Sears. Mm -hmm. And and, and we, we brought electricity. You know, the Wright brothers, one of the Wright brothers lived to see, God damn these dogs, lived to see jets. Oh my God. How is that possible? How do you how do you go from inventing air flight to seeing jets in, in, in your lifetime? And so I, I think that the modern economy is hugely a hollowed out thing, right? So 
you got Tesla, which is inventing ideas, but but the actual wealth creation is 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 still hard to detect. Um, its market cap is way out of proportion to what it actually produces. Uh, you've got Facebook that if it went away today, the world would be a better place. You got what, what Netflix. Netflix is a poor man's HBO. Charlie, get the fuck out of here. Um, he is a uh, Boston Terriers are half bulldog, half terrier. The bulldog part shows up occasionally. Um, the, the, Dave, real quick, the book that you're talking about is called The Rise and Fall of American Growth by Robert Gordon. And uh, that's brilliant. It's brilliant. And, and in the description on Amazon, uh, it says in the century of the Civil War, an economic revolution improved the American standard of living in ways previously unimaginable. Unima- Electric lighting, indoor plumbing, home appliances, motor vehicles, air travel, air conditioning, and television transformed households and workplaces. With medical advances, life expectancy between 1870 and 1970 grew from 45 to 72 years. And then it says Gordon challenges the view that economic growth can or will continue unabated. And he demonstrates that the life altering scale of innovations between 1870 and 1970 can't be repeated. He contends that the nation's productivity growth, which has already slowed to a crawl, will be further held back by the vexing headwinds of rising inequality, stagnating education, an aging population, and the rising debt of college students and the federal government. This episode is brought to you by Ledger, the best crypto hardware wallet. Everyone's heard the phrase, not your keys, not your coins. And that's more true today than it's ever been. Ultimately, a value proposition of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is self-custody, where you get to retain ownership over your digital assets. That is what Ledger specializes in. They've got multiple pieces of hardware, and they also have the Ledger Live mobile app, which makes it seamless to not only retain control over your Bitcoin, but also allows you to interface with exchanges, lending platforms, and other types of software products. If you're interested in upping your self-custody game, go check out Ledger today, shop.ledger.com. Again, that's shop.ledger.com. Go check them out and start doing self-custody. You'll thank me later. So, so, and and the people who have iPhones and stuff are going, well, that's just not true. But you go, okay, um, tell me how many times you have to do something online where it doesn't frustrate the shit out of you. <laughs> Things that just shouldn't have been put online now is online. And, and, and you know, I'm always amazed how many websites would benefit from just looking at how Amazon puts their website together. So I, I give them full credit for optimizing what it is they do. I think they've done a phenomenal job. But there, there are so many, co- again, Netflix baffles me. And, and then we replace Exxon from the Dow with Salesforce.com. What the hell is Salesforce.com? People say, oh, it's cloud this or cloud that. And I go, then how about Google if you want to do it? Why would you put in Salesforce.com? And, and I think they are, they're, they're, they're translucent companies. They're just, it's just not that good in my opinion. And, and, uh, and, and, and they're not transformational. I, I mean, progress is always forward. Even during the inflationary seventies, progress moved forward, you know, and transistors were invented and stuff like that. I can't remember the sixties, I guess was the transistor. <clears throat> but um, the other thing, Buffett recently, I'm not a big Buffett fan. I respect his ability to, to grow wealth, uh, not grow wealth, grow uh, personal wealth, um, not create wealth. But he, he pointed out that, um, that five of the six biggest companies in the world are U.S.-based companies. And if you look at them, they are these translucent type companies. Um, not that they haven't. God, wait, are you barking now, you fuckhead? Jesus Christ. And, um, and, uh, but he pointed out, he said, if you look back 20 years, here's the 20 biggest companies in the world, or 30 years. Um, and 14 of the 20 were Japanese. And he said, 30 years from now, it'll look that different again. So here's a guy who's always saying, oh, never bet against America who's saying 30 years from now, the five out of six biggest companies will not be American. Mm-hmm. And, and, and so in some sense, he's, he's trashing himself. He's trashing his own model. And uh, so the next 30, the other thing, I keep going back to the Zihan book. Zihan got into my skull last week. Um, um, 
it's, it, he, he's worth paying attention to. I, I, I don't, I, 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 I shouldn't talk about him because I'm still working my way through it. But Zihan's thinking is fat. He's overconfident, but he's he's uh, he's worth listening to. Um, never mind. Um, I, the future will not look like the past. That's the safe statement. Um, I think this next recession will be a killer because we have too much debt. The Federal Reserve has no ammo to fake our way out of it. Um, oh, and I kept trying to get to a thought that um, those three th things that occurred, four or five things that occurred momentously over the last 40 years that won't repeat. One of the things they did is they created an equity market. It was this relentless series of V bounces. So the market would try to correct and then it would bounce right back. And someone who says that a 20% drop that rallies back to where it was before within a year, if, if you want to call that a correction, have a ball, it corrected nothing, precisely nothing. All it did was reinforce the idea that you can't lose investing in stocks. Now, oh, guy you want to pay attention to, very, very off radar, off screen, uh, is a guy named Ed McQuarrie at UC Irvine. And he's analyzed markets back a couple hundred years. And, and he talks about, you know, equities and bonds. They break even. Ben Graham said that too. They break even. The, 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 the only, if you take the bond market disaster post-World War II, you know, omit a couple of decades there, the 200 years equities and bonds tie each other. And, so, and, and Graham said anyone who, who thinks equities necessarily beat bonds in return is delusional. Now, maybe, maybe things have changed now, but regression of the mean will occur, it always does. And if you look at something that's way, way, way off any sort of historical metric, I don't know when, but you gotta assume it's gonna regress. I, I, the bet as to when is dangerous, but the bet to bet that it won't regress, that, that's the most dangerous. Yeah, it, it, uh, the, it it's the mean for a reason, right? Yeah, it's the, and, <laughs> yeah. In fact, it's in fact what the Fed has done is prevented it from from ever going below the mean. You know, the markets weren't even that cheap in 08, 09. Mm -hmm. They 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 were below fair value for about a month. And I said that when I was at a dinner with um, Mark Spitznagel, who's who's one of these deep Zen types. Um, and he concurred. And Jeremy Grantham, too. They both said, look, they were below fair value for the, the, the shortest period of time. Mm -hmm. So, so if, if the horrific collapse of everything caused the markets to spend a month below fair, historical fair value, what did you correct? Mm -hmm. And people, you know, when the markets were down 20 percent, People would ask me, colleagues, ah, oh, the markets are down 20%. I'm getting real nervous. I said, okay, if a year and a half ago, I told you that you would not make any money over the next year and a half, would you have shit your pants? The answer is no. They say, yeah, that would be fine. Well, I said, that's what you just did. But the message also is we haven't corrected anything. We unwound a year and a half of fraud. Mm -hmm. We haven't even gotten back to the, I'm not even sure we're back to the pre-COVID peak, which was already a disastrously high peak. And so I think we're going to unwind. I think the S&P is going to unwind sub 2000. I, I, I had something jar me a little bit yesterday that made me wonder if my math's a little off, but I, I, I actually think we could get that at 1200. 1200? Yeah. I think it's that far out of whack. 1200 would be below historic fair value. Comfortably below. There, there's people but, right now who are going to hear you say that and they're going to go shut their computer and walk, go for a walk outside. Well, go go look at my pin tweet. Look at the 25 metrics of valuation. Yeah. And ask if you unwind those. I, I think the 25 point to about a 65% correction. Mm -hmm. Where does that get you to? It gets you to the mid-teens. And, and that only gets you to the mean. And you and I both know that you're supposed to spend half your statistically weighted time below the mean for it to be the mean. So you can say, ah, oh, the mean's now changed. Okay. 
Um, Ed, not um, 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 Ron Grease, and he goes by the name the Chart Master. Sent me a plot one day that I'd never seen, and I've never seen anyone else post it, and I don't know why. It is the return of the uh, of the S and P over the 20th century, the last hundred years, corrected for the M2 money supply, and it's dead flat. It's not gently sloping. It's dead flat. Is it possible that that's the way to correct for inflation? That's a Milton Friedman correction, right? That's money supply. Is it possible that the actual capital gains in the market through the last 100 years are zero corrected for M2? Probably. What that means is all you get are dividends. And the evidence that we're way over fair value is that the dividends are half what they used to be. They used to be around four, four and a half. Mm -hmm. Now they're terrible. But I do see opportunity. A, a bad secular bear market will hurt everybody. But if you're super patient, I think the energy sector looks good. I would rather buy it in a horrific sell-off. Um, but the inflation's got me a little edgier than normal. Um, the, the lost asset class, I keep throwing this out and it, it makes no difference. The lost asset class is platinum and platinum miners. Go look up the three biggest platinum miners, Sabanye, Imperial, and, uh, and, uh, Anglo-American platinum. And they have dividend yields in the high single digits, ca net cash in the balance sheet, PEs of five, when I asked a friend at RBC for more information on them, because I'm sitting there going, what am, what am I missing? And by the way, this is with platinum not having moved in 20 years. So they're printing money without platinum helping them. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I asked a friend from RBC for some of their inside information, and the data he sent me was five years old. And I said, that's all you got? And he said, that's it. So they're not even being looked at. And so I own some of the platinum miners. They've gotten cheaper since I bought them. And maybe there's geopolitical risk in South Africa. Um, there's geopolitical risk in every country, best I can tell. Um, and I, so there's that. Um, I used to be a big fan of the tobacco stocks, not morally, but financially. But then they went and bought vape companies. I kind of screwed that pooch. Um, there are things out there that you could buy if a gun got put to my head. I, I still think, I think the bear market has started. I think the secular bear market has started. How long can it go? How long the Nikkei go? Well, I would argue the Nikkei is still in a bear market. I knew you would argue that. <laughs> well, if you own the Nikkei in 1989, you're still underwater. Yeah. To me, to me, the definition of a recession being the downturn is bullshit. A recession, if you think about what, what the, the recession, the physical interpretation of a recession is a dip, a hole, a pivot, a, a divot from your, your sand wedge. Um, you're not out of a recession until you're out of the hole. If you're in a sand trap on the upslope, are you out of the trap? No. Mm -hmm. So to me, a recession should include both the downturn and the upturn required to get back to even. That's a recession to me. The Nikkei, if you if you bought the if you own the Nikkei in 1989, you're a 55 year old businessman. It's now it's now uh, 30 some odd years later. You're an 80 eight-year-old businessman and you're underwater, mm -hmm. right? You're not a businessman, by the way. You're just a broke old guy. And, and you couldn't trade it. I think the markets could become uninvestable. Let's say the Nikkei was the known universe. Let's say that's all you had, but it's a big market. It's the, it was the, the most famous country of its time for investing. Um, you couldn't do anything with the Nikkei for, for decades. There was no way to invest it. 
And 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 I got I got into a George Noble who's way smarter than me, but and he said, Well, you could short. I said, No, you couldn't. It took too long. The erosional cost would kill you. He said, Well, you could do this and that. He has all these fancy things. I said, Now you're talking professional class investing or trading. I said, We can't do that. I can't do that. Very few people can do that. And um so I think the markets could become uninvestable. The markets were uninvestable in uh, from 67 to 81. Mm -hmm. They treaded water, inflation unadjusted. They lost 75% inflation adjusted over 14 years. How old are you now, Bob? 34. So, so, so when you're 50 years old and you've gone nowhere, inflation, you've gone down 75% inflation adjusted. It's crazy. It's crazy. And the average investor doesn't know that's possible. They've been told that can't happen. Jeremy Siegel, by the way, Ed McQuarrie tears Jeremy Siegel a new one from head to toe. So Ed McQuarrie wrote a couple of papers on this. and They're really, he sends them to me. I don't know how he picked me out. Um, maybe I sent him an email. But in, investing is just not supposed to be this profitable. It's, it's Buffett said 4% a year. He said, when you take out all the fees or everything, 4% a year, Jeremy Grantham just quoted that same number in a podcast I listened to recently, 4%. If we buy AMC everything. stock though, we're going to, we're going to just go to the moon. The moon and back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's that crazy. It'll be like, uh, I, I drew an analogy between what's that one with uh, Sandra Bullock where gravity. Yep. I said, this is not like gravity. You're not going to get up and stagger away on some beach somewhere at the end of the movie. Right. So we, I, I, I've become rather dark. Right? I, I must admit, um, but I'm positioned such that unless the inflation really finds a way to shred me. And by the way, the fact that the metals are not responding at all is rather stunning. Gold miners look cheap to me. The gold yeah. miners are printing money now. I think um, the one thing I'll say is uh, most of the assets that people would have thought would be inflation hedge assets, uh, right. that is true, except for if you're in a liquidity crisis. And what right. I think we are watching is exactly what we saw in 20, uh, 2008. And I've talked about this right. over and over again. And, you know, frankly, uh, people who understand what happened then and understand how liquidity crisis worked, they kind of nod their head and say, yep, okay, that makes sense. People who don't just latch on to the fact that uh, an asset can only be an inflation hedge or not, right? It's just this black and white thing. And if you go back to 2008, gold went down 30%. And that didn't mean that it wasn't a, a safe haven. It didn't mean that it wasn't a non-correlated asset over a long period of time, any of that stuff. It just meant that for those six months of the summer of 08, when it went down 30%, along with everything else, there was a liquidity crisis and correlations went to one or close you to one. You sell whatever you can. Yes. And, and, uh, and, uh, I, you know, when I was a kid, I, I might have told you this in a previous podcast. I was having a conversation with my dad. He was a great street level economist running a construction business that survived. Um, and at one point I said to him, I said, so you could get wealthy buying real estate in the 30s. Mm -hmm. This is in high school. I said this to him. And he said, yeah, but no one had any money. And this somehow that planted the seed of an idea in my skull that said you have to have money at the bottom. Which means, therefore, you have to have money at the top. Mm -hmm. You can't hold on to shit to the bottom and then get money. <laughs> And so you, you, you really have to resist the, the irresistible urge to be invested when being invested has been so profitable. Now, ironically, he made a, probably a hundred fold off General Electric. And I tried to talk him into selling it because, because I paid attention to Jack Welch and his, and his, and his bean counting and stuff. And I, I knew that G, GM capital, uh, 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 GE capital was a problem and stuff like that. But how do you convince a guy who's made a hundredfold on a stock that he should sell it? And why the hell should he listen to you? Mm -hmm. And, and um, Morgan Housel's one of his most strong arguments in his book that again, I just finished is that you really, really, really want to resist the urge resist the urge to, to stop the compounding. 
So one of the reasons why you have to invest by your own personal metric is so that you don't bail. And so I try to buy an asset now in which I use Michael Berry's thesis that if, if worse comes to worse, you hang on to it. And that's not Netflix. And that's not ARC. That's none of those. That is kind of gold because you say, fuck it, right? Um, it's been around 5,000 years. I'll hang on to it. It, it, it is, it is uh, I don't know, quite a bit of Rio Tinto. Hmm. It would take an asteroid to take out their mining operations. They have a big dividend. They have a low PE. And, and they have cash in the balance sheet. And I just feel good about that. I, I don't, I'm, I'm avoiding every company with debt. I can handle a little as long as the debt's small relative to the revenues. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay. You know, one exception is tobacco. Dave, I literally could talk to you, I think, for like two days straight, no sleep. And we could talk about all the dark, crazy shit going on in the world. Uh, so what do you disagree with? You, I babble my ass off, but where would you say, oh, shit, you know, the, the, that part's the part I just can't sign off on. What, 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 what part think... did you have to bite your lip going, oh, fuck, we just lost our, we not only lost our audience, which you already have acknowledged, but, but you lost me too. Right? Was there any part that? I, I think the, uh, th there's two pieces. Um, one, I don't, well, actually, I don't know the answer to either one of them, but the one thing I would challenge is this idea that we're going to go into like a super deep, uh, kind of painful recession. And I agree with the analysis actually, right. That, that like, that is where we would be headed. Um, I probably have more confidence that the fed, uh, is going to wave the white flag pivot and just start dropping monetary stimulus all over the place again, you know, well before we get to, I don't know. Can they do that though? Here's the problem. This is why the inflation story is so important. Can they do it with inflation screaming at them? I, I don't this think that they have uh, the, the classic trade-off between inflation or recession, right? Uh, yeah. Was all Fed policy driven. They can do whatever. Now we have this stagflationary period. And I think they're going to have to choose you're going to have to bite the bullet on one. Which one are you going to bite the bullet on? And right. my guess is that if you say we are going to prevent a true on full, you know, catastrophic recession and people will have to live with high inflation, that is the lesser of the two evils because you and I will yell and scream from the hill, what are you guys doing? This is insane. Inflation sucks, all this stuff. But the average person, yeah, things got expensive. They have no clue what's going on. Whereas I'm not sure that's true. I, I think they're going to blame somebody. Oh, they, for 100%. But the people who are responsible aren't elected officials. And right. so from that standpoint, uh, you know, I, if you really look at it, like Powell getting reaffirmed, uh, reappointed, whatever you want to call it, uh, by Biden, I think was actually a pretty important data point yeah. on – okay, we're now going to go across party lines here. We are going to uh, kind of hang our hat on this approach, less, less the person and more the approach. Uh, and I'm always careful to say, like, I don't think that Jerome Powell, if he was to be replaced by somebody else, would necessarily look good or bad. I just think that somebody would do exactly what he's doing. Like he's doing what their data tells them to do and what their models and, and kind of their framework is. We just live in a really, really complex time where – you know, as you know, and we've talked about before, I don't think a human-led monetary policy is ultimately up for the task of navigating right. a world of unknowns, right? Like, I, I just I just find that uh, a losing battle. And so uh, I choose to uh, shield myself from it, you know, in a major way, right? And that's where obviously the, the Bitcoin stuff comes in. Now, mm -hmm. the downside to it on a day-to-day -day basis in the short term, if you're not looking at it from an investment standpoint, you're not looking at it from shielding, you know, your, your investment portfolio, all this. And you're saying, Hey, uh, I ha I live paycheck to paycheck, right. Going back to not having the $400. Can you put your economic wealth into an asset that goes up a lot and down a lot? And sometimes the, you know, both of those in the same week, 
Well, no. th- you know, a little bit harder to, to wrap your head around that. And, and so I think um, different people have different objectives, Right. And, and so I, I just find it hard that the Federal Reserve will allow us to go into some, you know, 08 style uh, recession. But if they do, I then question um, so much does inflation come down as much as just the base effect takes place. Right. Like this, like, well, nine the base point- effect, yeah, they, they eventually, uh, well, I, I'm not sure the base effect. In countries where inflation gets out of control, they don't get saved by the base effect. Yeah, yeah. But but what I'm saying is like if you look at uh so the the zero percent inflation from June to, to July, right? They're celebrating saying, you know, all the No, no, all that's not true though. That's just a lie. Of course. There was there was eight and a half percent inflation. Of course. And so that eight and a half percent though, remember, I think it was June of twenty twenty one was the first month we had over five percent inflation and it never came back down. We have now gone right. more than 12 months with over 5% inflation in the United States of America. And so if we have 8.5% in July of 2022, that is now compounding. We are, we're now That's in the compounding exactly game. exactly right. And, and, so, um, and so one thing we know is that if inflation stays up, we are not going to be talking five years from now, but I don't see how this has stayed up without causing a problem. Correct. Because, because it, it, if, if you're losing 10% of your spending power a year, and that goes on more than one year, again, half the country is going to be starving mm-hmm. pretty soon. So this, this, is a, um, this is a countdown clock right here. This is a countdown clock and loss. This is... Um, this, this, so, so, so this is not sustainable. There's the other. That's the little one. <laughs> this, she's a perpetual puppy. Um, the, the other thing that I would t- say to you is, uh, again, I agree with your analysis on uh, the non-financial events. A lot of the data points don't add up. A lot of the data points just leave you scratching your head saying, what what is going on, right? Right. And uh, I think it was actually you who maybe two years ago, I think you were doing a podcast with Marty Bent. And in it, you were going over your year in review and you said something that always stuck with, I'm pretty sure it was you, who said, you know, the problem with the climate change debate is that most of the analysis that is done, the thesis gets negated when the experiments are done. And so naturally, some portion of the scientific community basically just throws their hands up and says, well, we tested all our other ideas, so it must be humans. Right. Rather than go and prove, here is exactly what humans are doing, but whatever, right? And I kind of feel a little bit like uh, when you get into the really dark stuff, not not you uh, personally, but like just the deeper you you go down these rabbit holes, uh, and we all do it. It, It's kind of like... um, uh, it's kind of like the modern version of uh, the thing that you do that you don't want anyone to know you do, except for just some weirdos <laughs> like you and I that that we end up talking about it, right? But like people get on the yeah, internet and they start Googling around and they end up in some weird place and then they're kind of like, oh shit, like how did I get here? You know, whatever. But things don't make sense. And so we've now seen enough examples where we're losing trust in institutions or we feel like we're being uh, misled or or whatever, we just immediately assume it's nefarious. And I do wonder um, if if you try to fight that, which is very hard. I mean, I I fall victim to it all the time. How much of it is just like, the world is weird. We don't understand a lot of shit. And so like you can take a bunch of data points and like the natural conclusion may not be the actual answer versus – like, no, this shit's real dark and like there's really fucking nefarious things that happen. And like, you know, we just happen to have uncovered the the data points or the ingredients. And so we just haven't yet found the smoking gun that, you know, ends up with the conclusion. And each situation is different, right? I, so I don't know. I think, it's, I think it's easier to detect the bullshit than to undo it and to unravel it. And so I, I you know, when you start catching people lying to you. So the climate change, the, one of the first tip offs is that you start running into big lies. And, 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 and they actually philosophically believe that their cause is so just that 
that lying is legit. It's sort of like if Trump's Hitler, then of course you do anything to make sure that he doesn't get reelected. And if you really think he's Hitler, of course the dog's doing it again. If you really think he's Hitler, then who who wouldn't do anything to prevent him from getting reelected? Mm -hmm. And the mob psychology where you, you all agree, right? You and your echo chamber agree that he's Hitler. And so you you get reinforced. And I think to go down unconventional paths, you need some reinforcement, but there's an optimum in that curve. So you need reinforcement so that so you don't feel so insane that you just can't do it. So when I was buying gold in 1999, there was not much reinforcement, but there was a couple of key players who were going, you know, this is looking like a pretty good time to be buying gold. And, and, uh, and without that, I couldn't have done it. And, and when I was buying tobacco stocks and I got, I think it was like 2003 or I can't even remember it was so long ago when they were facing a big lawsuit and stuff. And, and uh, it, it took me a while to piece together the story to say, um, this lawsuit can't hurt him. As soon as I realized the lawsuit couldn't hurt him, I go, oh, these are a buy now. And, um, and so I can, I think, I, I think I'm okay at generating enough concern, uh, at digging out enough data to say, okay, the story we're being told is wrong, but without digging out enough data to be able to say, and this is the true story, because that's a totally different bar. That's a totally different standard. And, and, and if they're really good at being nefarious, you could be 20 layers of the onion wrong. And you know, all you have to do is like things like, you know, rem you don't remember, but you know, when we found out that Reagan was trading arms for hostages and stuff like that, you go, what? Really? And all of a sudden you find out, wait a minute, we're, 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 we're now allied with Al Qaeda or the Taliban. Wait, weren't they the bad guys at one point? So the very surreal world. And, and, and then you, you, you watch someone like, like Khashoggi get killed in the Saudi embassy, right? He's one fucking guy. Who cares? I mean, who the hell cares? He's one guy in the Saudi embassy. You go to Saudi Arabia, you get killed. Excuse me, that's a Darwin Award as far as I'm concerned. And, and it, it's a shame for the family. But meanwhile, the press completely ignores tens of thousands being killed in Yemen by the Saudis. One dead Khashoggi versus tens of thousands of Yemenis. There's no way to explain those two in the contextually. The juxtaposition of those two facts just doesn't make sense without invoking geopolitical, nefarious, propaganda-rich everything. I, I went back and read Edwin Bernays' classic 1926 book on propaganda just to, to look at what the, the godfather of the field said about propaganda. We're slathered with propaganda. It's, it's part of our culture. So everything, you know, when they try to sell you a car, it's propaganda. But where it gets dubious is, is when the government is using propaganda to get you to sign off on just total dog shit. And, and now that the government is 50% of our GDP, it's, you know, back at the turn of the century, the other century, the government was like 3% of GDP. It didn't matter, right? The world just, it kind of ran itself and the government was this, yeah, you could get some senator to pass some law that made your business work better. But, but now the trillions and trillions of dollars are being handed out. So Halliburton went from being a, a company that used to be involved in getting energy out of the ground to a company in, whose sole purpose is to get government contracts. That's their entire business model is to get government contracts. And, and, and government's now so big and the corruption therefore is so deep. And, and like the, back to climate change, people say, well, you know, big oil's paying you. I, got, there's, I have tried to find the thread of big oil to climate deniers. I can't find it. And there's a lot of people trying to say it's there. I can't find it. What I can tell you is, is the, the, the climate industrial complex, on the other hand, they're projecting $150 trillion to be spent on it. 
That's that that's serious money. That starts adding up after a while. And so again, for me, the climate change story changed when I found out that they were lying their ass off constantly. And 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 we can talk about that if you want. I mean, the first lie is that there's no credible scientists who don't believe it, right? That's the standard statement. The only guys who don't believe it are not credible. Nobel Prize winning physicists all over the globe have denounced it, but no one cares. The, the former head of the National Academy of Science says it's the biggest hoax in history. Is he not credible? The guy who used to run NASA's temperature monitoring program says there's no, there's no warming. The, the 500 PhD scientists at NASA wrote a letter saying, please cut back on your rhetoric. There, there, there's gazillions of people screaming at the top of their lungs that this story is wrong. You know Doomberg, right? I do. Doomberg is a smart bastard, and I know his background, and, and he was highly placed. And he said when he gets into this debate, he just points out that, um, that, that the equations are all nonlinear. And anyone who does modeling knows a, nonlinear, a, a pile of nonlinear equations can't be solved. And so, uh, so I, no, I, I think, I think most of what we're being told is a big lie, but does it matter? Most of the time, no. Mm -hmm. I've, I've turned on pharma like you wouldn't believe COVID destroyed pharma's rep. Mm -hmm. I, I, if, if, if you're taking, if you're taking a drug to lower your blood pressure, you should talk to your doctor. You got duped. If you're taking Nexium, you got duped. If you, there, there's just so many, there's so many drugs out there that, that, that not only serve no purpose, but that they, my wife just took a drug. For, uh, she has a vomiting disorder. And, uh, and Dylan was working and stopped working. So, we, so I, we went to doctors recently and they put her on a new one called Lamotrigine or something. One in 10 people get a rash that sends them to the ER. One in 10. Is that, and can be fatal. It, the FDA cleared that? That's a miracle drug to take that kind of risk. And I think the FDA is now clearing drugs with no justification whatsoever. I think the FDA has been completely commandeered by Big Pharma. Completely, 100%. And, and, and I could be convinced that there are good drugs coming out still. I was involved in Chantix in a very sort of peripheral way. And, but, but I think so many of the drugs we're taking, you know the drug from Biogen that got cleared for Alzheimer's? No. Last year, in the middle of the vaccine push, Biogen got a drug cleared for Alzheimer's. $56,000 a year. It turns out that the FDA panel, I think 13 said no. And the 14 said, I'm not sure. And the FDA cleared it. I just found out from a book I just finished on the FDA that they actually had terminated the clinical trials. And then also now the blue, they cleared the drug anyways. So I think the pharmaceutical industry has gone from trying to develop legitimate drugs to developing a business model where they can push drugs through regardless of their efficacy. And, 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 and they can win in court. Of course. It's, it's, a, it's a tax. And so I don't think I'll ever take a drug which I can't identify the positive effect. So if I have an infection, I get it. If I have a rash and the steroid makes it go away, I get it. But if you say some level of something of mine is too high or too low, I'm not taking it. The statins are a nightmare. The whole statin story, the people taking blood pressure mod modifying medicines, there are people who need it because they're super high risk, but they're, 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 um, they're giving it to everybody. Mm -hmm. They're saying, oh, your blood pressure is 160 over, you know, 100. You should, I, we should put you on a statin. They did a clinical trial looking for 
evidence that that was needed. And the clinical trial failed. Didn't stop them. Um, my, my wife was on a drug called Neuron. It's a, it was passed for shingles pain. Pfizer said, okay, let's see if we can get this cleared for neuropathic pain. And it turns out that uh, it turns out that that they did a clinical trial and they got nothing, nothing, zero bupkis. And 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 then they called in a bunch of experts and said, look at the data again, make lemonade out of lemons, find a way. And and the internal documents from a court case said nothing. This this group said it's over, game over, not going to happen. They approached the FDA informally, and the FDA said, don't bother. And what did they do? They got a couple of academics to write a bunch of fraudulent papers on the potential of Neurontin for neuropathic pain in general. Pfizer then bought a million copies and they handed them out to doctors all over the world. 98% of Neurontin's market is off-label generalized neuropathic pain. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I believe, here's what I think has happened to pharma. They have picked all the low-lying fruit, period. They've got the antibiotics. They've got some antivirals. And now they're, they're, they're trying to go for lifestyle. Mm-hmm. They're trying to go for things that just change who you are, sort of. And, um, and I think, therefore, what it means is it's an industry that should be shrinking, because there are no longer low-lying fruit. And, and, and instead of naturally shrinking like people who made wagons for a living in, in 1900, they have chosen to use um, graft corru- and corruption to keep their business model going. Dave, I want to stop right there. We're just going to... As a ending yep. uh, sentence, I think there's more of it in the world than you and I uh, want to uh, uh, to see or, uh, or or admit to others. Um, there's a lot of people who may not have heard uh, our previous conversations. Where can we send them to find you on the internet uh, or find the year in review uh, or any of the other things that you write? Well, if you search my name, David Column. And you're in review, and then you put in a date. It's gotten harder because Peak Prosperity changed their website, but you'll find year in reviews for each year back about a dozen years. Um, if you go to Twitter, it's David B. Column as the handle. I figure I'm not long for this world on Twitter. I think they're. I think I'm close to getting booted. I just found out yesterday. I'm been. I get. There's a bot that checks and seeing if you're being silenced. And I scored worse than Alex Berenson and James Woods. So, and there's very few people who are scoring poorly and I, I, they're, I've noticed funny things. So I think I'm going to be on Twitter for a limited period. Uh, but at David B. Column, the year in review from last year is my pinned tweet. And, and it's, uh, be careful. It's not for the faint of heart. It's 300 pages. We will definitely do this again. Maybe we'll do it again when uh, when you write this year's. Uh, yeah, ho- I wore you down. I think. Ho- hopefully, I, I, no. Hopefully, you're going to write this year's going to be 400 pages. No, it's not actually. I've, I I I I have to invent. I have to reinvent it somehow. I, I've been thinking of various angles to come. Just at write it. a 10 pager. Just like super short 10 pages. The problem is you can't get into anything. Then it just becomes a shallow list of bullets. <laughs> you you can't digest a topic that efficiently. That is very so, uh, true. I'm, a, I'm just going to have to leave shit on the cutting room floor. All right, my friend. I appreciate it as always. Uh, every time I talk to you, you make me think much more deeply about various uh, aspects of the world, but also financial markets. And uh, we will definitely do this again. So I appreciate your time today. Adios, muchacho. It was fun.